Of the digital campus of the IDB Academy here at the Inter-American Development Bank, we would like to warmly welcome to you during uh, our Knowledge Week. Hope you were able to enjoy your break. 
I am Veronica Ruiz del Viso, and it's an honor to be here with you this afternoon as we represent uh, female entrepreneurs who are proposing solutions to the region. This is enormous responsibility and a major honor to be able to work with the entire team at IDB Academy. Before we start, let me just share with you some brief uh, announcements. The event has interpretation services in Spanish, English, Port and Portuguese. It is available on any of our YouTube channels. You will also find the LinkedIn and Facebook uh, links there. So we now that we've uh, recharged our batteries, we're ready for the next uh, presentation. We're going to be looking at the new trends and how they impact the regional integration in Latin America and the Caribbean and see exactly what are some of the uh, consequences as we join this uh, evolution as that is a revolution that is going on throughout the region. So we're going to have various experts as our guests. We have uh, Ambassador Marta Barcena, distinguished ambassador and senior advisor at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. In addition to being an advisor at the Adrian Arsh Latin American Center in the Atlantic Council, we also have with us Lorenzo Caliendo, who is a professor of economics at the Yale, Univer Yale University School of Business. And then thirdly, we have Mauricio Mequita Moreira, who is senior economic advisor in the integration and trade sector at the IDB who will provide a brief introduction that will set the stage for our discussions. So I hope you enjoy this event. I would like to thank our distinguished panelists for being here with us. Mauricio, you have the floor. Thank you, Vero. Good morning, good afternoon, depending on where you are located. Thank you for joining us. It is an enormous uh, pleasure and privilege to have with us, two of the most uh, outstanding uh, experts in the region and in the hemisphere to help us look at how we can address and the um, challenges in trade and integration in, in a very challenging environment. Ambas Ambassador Barcela has a vast array of experience in working with one of the largest economies in the region. And in particular, she worked in the United States during the time of the uh, efforts that led to the ratification of the free trade agreement between uh, the US, Mexico and Canada, one of the most uh, significant uh, economic integration agreements, not just in the region, but also in the hemisphere. Lorenzo, well, what I can say about him is he's an economist's economist. He tries to always get a better understanding of the impacts on trade, trade agreements, trade flows, jobs creation, and economic well-being. So thank you very much for joining us, uh, both of you. And I think we're going to have a very excellent uh, dialogue. Before I offer the floor to you, I would just like to briefly just set the stage for these uh, discussions. I think the ministers, uh, trade ministers in the region, and today are looking at the perfect storm. They're constantly being bombarded by various uh, assertions that we're now faced with a new world order. Some assert that it is the end of globalization as we know it. And this is as a result of various economic and technological trends, some more recent, some more long-term, and many recent uh, economic shocks that have, and geopolitical events, in addition to the pandemic. So for us, we have uh, also seen um, some advice provided stating that we need to um, we need to uh, take stock of the st standards and the procedures that were implemented throughout the uh, region, and in particular, the chapters and economic agreements that deal with economic integration. 
just to use, um, for example, the, what they call the neoliberal chapter in which integration and trade are are, are uh, hopefully uh, able to provide the sustainable and equitable growth levels. Within these, I think among the trends that generated the greatest concern, I we have, for example, the issue of the worsening of the geopolitical tensions, tensions between China, the United States, the two major trading partners in the region. Recently, we also had Russia with uh, versus the West. And so what we're seeing here as a result is a reduction in opportunities, offshoring as a result of uh, digitalization um, advances and also uh, through automation, robotics in manufacturing in uh, industrialized countries. And then you also have the increasing demand for achieving greater resilience and timeliness in the global value chains. Many as a result of the uh, health uh, healthcare and pandemic um, upheavals and shocks. So we have uh, geopolitically all of this uh, demand, increasing demand for better uh, benefits from trade and entrepreneurial uh, gains. So we also have the, the la last but not least, we have the environmental concerns, those pressures where poli policy makers need to reduce the carbon footprint associated with uh, trade. So with that perfect storm of information and trends, the uh, we, we saw that this led to a paralysis in uh, economic policies, and this would be at the worst possible uh, moment. As you know, the region experienced the worst recession in its history in terms of poverty, unemployment levels, and this is pretty clear in our most recent uh, estimates that trade is perhaps the most promising trend that will pave the way for economic recovery. So now uh, with that, I'll conclude my remarks and I'll offer the floor to the panelists. So we will start off with some uh, general questions. The first one has to do with the trends. So among the trends announced that are leading the way in changes in the global economic scenario, what are the ones that are most significant? And what are some of the um, implications that they have with regards to economic integration in the region? I'd like to start with uh, Marta. Thank you very much, uh, Mauricio. Hello, good morning, uh, Lorenzo, and everyone here who has joined us during the uh, Knowledge Week uh, Act activities. Uh, I'm very pleased to be a part of this discussion, especially looking at such a key issue for Latin America and for the hemisphere as a whole. In other words, the dream for the region has always been an attempt to achieve integration that sometimes seems to be more uh, far flung than uh, closer to us. So I believe, uh, well, Mauricio, I think you clearly stated some of the describe some of the trends that are having an impact on integration efforts not just that but also the trade policies i i think we are seeing in latin america a strong criticism to what you describe mauricio as the neo liberal chapter of the last few years that to a large extent is reflected in the free trade agreements so why do we see this uh, criticism lodged in uh, many countries? Well, I think because just as in any other process, you're going to have winners and losers. And yet, despite the gains that we've seen overall for countries such as Mexico, for example, because the Mexico of today 
We have, for example, in Mexico before the free trade agreement and Mexico after free trade agreements. So it before Mexico depended solely or principally on oil exports. Now it's manufactured goods that um, of the total GDP uh, exports, it's increased significantly. And now it's a country that is full, uh, fully devoted to trade. And then again, this significant part of GDP is a part of that. So now with, uh, first of all, the free trade agreement, the first free trade agreement, and now uh, the MCI one, we are seeing an increase. So looking at uh, Mexico that um, had been focused on agricultural exports, and what we see now is that although the Mexican economy has grown, had grown, it didn't grow at the pace that was expected. However, that, that uh, did not lead to diminishing the inequality gap. And that's the major challenge, not just for Mexico, but for all of Latin America. And some, I think, uh, Lorenzo is a renowned economist. He can tell us even further. How closely linked is this or how much can be done so that free trade will have an impact, meaningful impact on reducing inequalities, which up until now has not happened? I think that's what is significant for the region. And also, I think we've seen a notorious increase in um in trade patterns throughout the region. If you if you just quickly review the trade flows in Latin America with the US and with China, Canada, you'll notice that currently, I think only Mexico, Colombia, and Paraguay continue to have as their first trading partner, the United States, their number one trading partner. Whereas, and some of the Central American countries probably have the U.S. as their main trading partner, whereas the other countries in South America now have as their number one trading partner, China. And that trade with China is based in particular on the ex exports of raw materials from many of these uh, Latin South American countries in particular, whereas Mexico's trade is now based on manufactured goods exports. However, we are becoming an increasing um, trading partner with China with greater deficits. And now it's becoming um, more and more involved in the, um, the value chains, especially with Mexico in the automobile value chain. So that is another component that leads us to think and ask, how can we build a regional integration model with the US and the rest of Latin America and the Caribbean, if for many countries in Latin America and the Caribbean, the United States is no longer its number one trading partner. So to what extent can we progress in that regard? And then if we look at the Russian invasion of Ukraine, what we're also identifying now are two specific uh, phenomena that are having a significant impact on any regional integration initiative. The first one has to do with food security or insecurity, because we've seen a trend by various countries, including China, to just shut down their flow of exports and not allow for exports in order to ensure that there are enough uh, food products coming in and grain shipments. However, the uh, FAO has had a call now calling for continuing to maintain free trade in grain shipments. Otherwise, you're going to have countries in Africa and the Middle East severely affected. The great advantage in Latin America is that we, if you put together Canada, Argentina, Mexico, Brazil, the United States, we have five major grain producers, as well as uh, fruit and vegetable producers. In Latin America, there's enough food produced for 1.3 billion people, and we're 6 million total. So this is a region that can easily be self-sufficient at the same time export goods. However, there's still a high level of food insecurity. Secondly, we are now seeing a restructuring of the energy markets through that um, cutting off of um, Russia's uh, energy supplies. So then the question is, what role can Latin America play in that restructuring of energy markets? It's not just a, as a provider of oil, 
which will perhaps have less uh, significance, but also natural renewable energies, that energy transition. And I believe we've lost the sound. We do not have any sound. Ambassador, we lost your sound. Creo que estás en, en mute por accidente, quizá. No, no, no la escuchamos. Uh, uh, yo apagué por a ver, ¿Ya me oyen mejor? Sí, ahora sí. Can you hear me better now? Es que yo creo que el, I must have. Uh, yo creo que el, el, la batería, quizá. Eh. Probablemente. Maybe my battery went. Eh, or something was disconnected. So as I was saying, on the one hand, we have these protectionist uh, trends and patterns in various regions and in areas. And in particular, we have these uh, trends toward maintaining open markets. And I think the uh, WHO meeting of the last uh, few weeks of the world trade uh, WTO uh, discuss that. And I think there are more questions than solutions that need to be addressed in Latin America in order to determine exactly where can we go? Where do we want to uh, go when we uh, continue forward with uh, regional integration? Thank you very much, Ambassador, for these uh, very interesting um, reflections. And now, I offer the floor to Lorenzo. I don't know if you can hear me. Let me just take this opportunity. Can everybody hear me? Let me take this opportunity to thank Mauricio for those uh, kind words of introduction. I'd like to thank Marta as well. And I know Marta has now uh, raised some new questions as in addition to the ones we heard earlier. Well, I think Mauricio's comments and also Marta's uh, thoughts really were important in raising that question as to how are we going to reach this, um, th this end state? I know that there's a lot of uncertainty in the global economy right now. And why is this the perfect storm? as you said. Well, actually, I think it's uh, bringing together a various uh, storms and storm systems. So over the last 20 years, I would say, going back to 2001, the global economy with uh, the rise of China, especially when it uh, joined the WTO, I think that together with uh, many of the methodologies and uh, academic uh, analyses and data that we didn't have in the past. Today, we can measure trade impacts at the regional level, at the, in other words, a disaggregated level, the industry levels and other categories. So with China's opening of, up of its uh, economy and then together with these new technologies and measures, and also the lessons learned that we have taken from um, trade openness that had had many positive impacts at first, but also created many heterogeneous, uh, effect, heterogeneous effect. Not all workers were impacted in the same way from trade openness and not all sectors were, um, were benefited. Some were, some benefited and others suffered. So what is true is that in the short term, again, we see these uh, imbalances and disparities, but we see in the long term, we have positive effects. The question that policymakers always pose, and we look at that as well, how can we ensure that these benefits are positive for everyone? And I think this is where we have made some progress, including policymakers. And in 2018, we saw that 
as we uh, addressed these uh, redistribution effects and in particular if we look at the united states that decided to go back to trades and trade and tariffs trade tariffs and we saw in 2018 the united states imposed 50 percent uh, tariffs on uh, some goods and unilaterally in many cases toward china so the u.s trading partners then in turn increased their tariffs on u.s exports so studies have shown looking at the uh, trade wars that these uh, tariffs have not addressed the uh, redistribution uh, effects if anything it's also now contributed to other uh, detrimental effects it's having although they feel they're protectionists and protecting their economy they're also having unexpected consequences in other areas very many producers who are getting the who are importing goods from china who have also been severely and detrimentally affected so as you were discussing marta that redistribution impact doesn't seem to come uh, into the forefront so if we look get uh, from the uncertainties in 2018 and 2019 the, the u.s decided to impose a, a block the uh, resolutions from the wto where they have a sort of a council of uh, arbiters who are involved in arbitration of disputes and that decision making at the world trade organization has become inactive since 2019 because of the obstacles imposed by the united states so we have uncertainty in the redistribution and trade how do we resolve that and how countries have uh, taken unilateral steps to try to rectify this they didn't work and then all of that was taking place on the eve of a major pandemic that finally ensued so we continue to be in this situation because Despite the uh, world global uh, pandemic crisis, we still have countries that are involved in lockdowns like China that have an impact on the supply chains, the global supply chain. So this generates in turn even more uncertainties. The fact that the with the pandemic, some countries were able to use tariff reduction measures in order to access essential supplies and goods so as as a result of this global health care um, crisis they were able to use many of these uh, devices and mechanisms to address uh, the uh, their needs some countries began also to uh, restrict Ex imports so the issue here is that we've seen uncertainties unleashed by the pandemic because the policies such as lockdowns in shanghai are having consequences on the supply chains globally and now they're discussing many of these uncertainties and then finally and as marta was pointing to now we have the icing on the cake which was a war that was unleashed and what we're seeing is that the fact that countries are so interconnected today, they're now using trade as a means of sanctioning the Russian economy. And that can only be effective in a global economy. So over the last 20 years, the changes and the measuring, at least those winners and losers, the changes related to these adverse shocks that have really uh, highlighted these um, first of all the need to discuss exactly what needs to be done so that these uh, short-term measures can also be focused on redistribution the question is what would have happened during the pandemic if the world had not been as globalized as it had already achieved there would have been probably even 
greater inequalities. It's possible that another question that uh, I would pose is, is it necessary to restructure everything after the 20 year uh, series of sh adverse shocks, or perhaps there, there was an absence of understanding or getting, getting a better understanding of the effects. Maybe we can we need to continue to uh, examine these adverse effects so that we can respond specifically. What measures that re are required? Maybe we need to globalize the process so that it can uh, trickle down to everyone. So we're also looking at today that the, the global economy today is not just an exchange of uh, goods, but also services. And the pandemic really shone a light on the some of the needs that are required to be addressed during the pandemic, such as, for example, buying medical equipment. Now we've learned buying masks and other uh, protective devices and measures. So Mauricio, today we are seeing, as you pointed out, a perfect storm, which is, and I think this has been very important to get a better understanding of the uh, patterns and of the uh, global economy and how it's evolved and and see exactly what measures if perhaps we have to take a step back thank you lorenzo very clear and i would now like to move on to the next question and this is a question for the ambassador could you tell us about the experience with the USMCA, the trade agreement with the United States, Mexico, and Canada. And do you think that that treaty is an adequate response to political pressures, social and economic pressures, to incorporate issues like labor, the environment, and integration agreements in general? Could that treaty be a model? Yes or no? Madam Ambassador, please. Thank you, Mauricio. That is a very relevant question. When the renegotiation of NAFTA began, and Mexico did this because of the unilateral threat from President Trump, to withdraw from the agreement and to come up with some other legal arrangement to substitute for NAFTA. And that meant that that would affect the integration of North America and would also be very detrimental to Mexico's economy. So negotiations started for a new agreement. And in many areas that was complicated, but it did represent a shift an evolution in terms of the relationship under the Free Trade Agreement of North America. Now, what were the major changes? Now, there were some new chapters included in the USMCA that were not part of NAFTA. And this represents, I think, what we can expect from future free trade agreements, especially those that mean that the U.S. will be a party to them. And that was stated very clearly. They said, look, we want to negotiate a trade agreement that will be a template, that will be the basis for any other agreement negotiated by the United States in the future. So any country in Latin America that is thinking that it will be able to negotiate a free trade agreement with North America will have to study the issue because that is going to be the template. It will be the basis for any negotiation on free trade with the United States. If the United States is willing to engage in such an exercise, because right now I don't detect much appetite on the part of the United States to negotiate any new FTAs. Now, what are these issues? One, digital trade. Digital trade previously did not exist, and it is in keeping with an evolution of the world's economy. And then another thing is including gender perspectives for several issues. 
supporting women entrepreneurs. And that is very important for Latin America. And then third, attention to the rights of indigenous groups. That is something we hadn't seen before. We also have a special chapter that was not part of NAFTA on small and medium-sized enterprises. And that is essential because usually they are the major job creators. And another thing, we have two very important chapters with their annexes, and they represent a major, actually there are three chapters that represent a major change. And in my opinion, they do have some protectionist bias. One is the labor chapter. Why? Because the United States says, if too many companies are moving to Mexico, that is because Mexico is competing by lowering wages. So what are we going to do? We're going to ask Mexico to raise the minimum hourly wage in certain sectors. The automobile sector, for example, $16 per hour in certain sectors, not in the entire automobile industry, but for engineers, etc. So that's one thing. But another thing the United States is saying is, we know that in Mexico, there is something called a protected contract, and they're right. And President Lopez Obrador, as president-elect, did sign off on the labor chapter because these protected contracts were protected by the labor union that had been one of PRI's uh, major political allies, CTM. So the acceptance of the measures in the labor chapter represented reviewing protected labor contracts. And another possibility of wage increase, wages have gone up in Mexico, our minimum wage went up under the current regime as never before in previous administrations. And second, the possibility of freedom of association. Mexico ratifies by ratifying the USMCA, one of the two major agreements under the ILO in terms of freedom of association and labor unions. And also there was a quick response mechanism created so as to be able to report violations of freedom to form unions or freedom of association. So there is a 90-day period to respond to those complaints. So what we see is that the USMCA, Temec in Spanish, does contain elements that protect workers, mechanisms that did not exist under NAFTA. And that is something that we will see in future FTAs. Now, there are the weaknesses too, because there are those requirements on Mexico and Canada, but in the United States, they forgot that in the Southern part of the United States, there is no guarantee of the right to form labor unions in the Southern states. So here you see how important that labor chapter is. Then there is an environmental chapter. That chapter includes an obligation, which is to comply with the content of different international treaties in, that have to do with the environment. That would be, for example, the treaty against trading in endangered species, that, for example. And that means that by signing the USMCA, Mexico not only accepted that environmental issues were important, but also by being party to those international treaties, it took on a dual responsibility to comply with those treaties. So any other country that thinks that they can sign an integration agreement with the United States, and here, let's suppose that CAFTA gets updated to make it part of USMCA. That means that those signatory countries would have to 
also adhere to all of the treaties that have to do with the environment that are listed in the USMCA. So it's a complicated issue. Now, another thing that's very important and that makes uh, USMCA more than a free trade agreement, it's more a treaty on integration of North America. And that is the content regulations where the limit was raised, the goal was raised to 75% content. But right now, Mexico faces some challenges, and that is regarding the interpretation of rules of origin. For example, in terms of parts of aluminum that uh, are affecting Japanese labor partners in Mexico. So the whole idea was to strengthen the production platform of North America because Mexico does not produce cars that go to the U.S. market. They're no longer produced in Mexico. So people will say it's a Mexican car or it's a Canadian car. No, they're North American cars because parts for cars can cross the border more than seven times. In Mexico, we produce the Audi 25 for the whole world. So North America is now a platform, a production platform for globalization, not only for North America, not only for the U.S. market. And this is a challenge. It's something that we'll have to examine in the future if, based on the USMCA, integration is expanded to Central America and then uh, throughout the rest of the hemisphere. So how would those platforms for production interact? How would all of that work? And that takes us to the next point, something that has to do with USMCA. One, in contrast to NAFTA that had no sunset date, USMCA does not have a sunset date either, but it, it does have a review date, and that will be in 2025. In 2025, there will be an in-depth discussion that unfortunately may get politicized on how beneficial USMCA has been and how much it has been complied with. So that is something that is interesting, something we didn't have in previous agreements. Then secondly, also the USMCA has a very complicated bureaucratic arrangement, a mechanism, where several committees, review committees, ongoing review committees are created. And what we see with the world crisis, with the invasion of Ukraine, with the pandemic, etc., is that getting these bureaucratic operations up and operating is not easy. So here we have to rethink how efficient these collaboration mechanisms are. And that takes us to other points. In addition to those constant review mechanisms, the cooperation mechanism, the review, the sunset clause, we have a mechanism that was approved unilaterally by the U.S. Congress in the implementation legislation that's tremendously strict. The U.S. Congress has to receive from the executive periodical reports with information on what is viewed as compliance with the obligations uh, taken on by Mexico in the USMCA. And that was a demand from the Democratic representatives in Congress. And you have to remember that the head of the technical team of the Ways and Means Committee in the U.S. Congress is currently the U.S. Trade Representative. So she is tremendously clear and knows that any bilateral regional negotiation in Latin America is going to follow the template that she supported 
when she was on the Ways and Means Committee and that led to the USMCA. So this brings me to a final point. And this is something I think that we need to discuss. And that is the difference between the USMCA and the project of integration in the EU. USMCA does not have elements that level the playing field. That would be the structural funds in the European Union, nor does it have funding mechanisms. The only financing mechanism that exists under the USMCA, and it was created because of a law outside of USMCA and NAFTA, is the uh, North American Development Bank, but it does have funding for environment and infrastructure along the Mexico-U.S. border. So here, the question is, I'm sorry, Ambassador, I would like to come back to that topic in my third question. That's great. Okay. Right. Because it has to do with the agenda that we would like to implement in terms of integration of the region. So that takes me to my third question, and it is, no, actually it's the second question. And again, it's for Lorenzo. It has to do with trade, integration. As we know, in the public opinion, there are many challenges, especially in terms of young people. The popularity of these issues with young people is uh, not all that great, to put it mildly. So what would you say? What would you say from the standpoint of economists? So is this a challenge of keeping the general public better informed, especially informing young people about the costs, the benefits of integration, et cetera, et cetera? Thank you, Mauricio. That's a very interesting and very hard question. But I wanted to say, Marta, that what you were saying was fascinating. Now, I think that generally speaking, we still don't understand what the benefits are. Value added, we can talk about how much the value of a product is affected, etc. But it's really hard to see that in terms of benefits in our day-to-day -day trade, how much revenue, how much wages are affected by exporting or importing goods, or if it's a services firm that uses traded goods indirectly, how much of the price is lowered because we have access to FTAs with other countries of the world. So how is trade affected on a daily basis? It's really hard to quantify and it's hard to see. So much so that there is a study that I would like to quote, and that is a study from Laura Alfaro from Harvard. And she did a survey in the United States interviews 45,000 individuals, asking them questions, showing them evidence from empirical studies, looking at the impact of international trade, also looking at NAFTA, USMCA, and then ask questions about what they think. And the first thing that she hears from the general public is surprising comments, things that contradict each other. And I, of course, encourage you all to read that study. It is by Professor Alfaro. So what you find is that, yes, people like the idea of having access to cheaper goods, but they don't understand that that cheaper access goes hand in hand with the fact that we have to open up to China or Europe. Now, on one hand, People like the idea of wages being protected and that certain industries will not close their doors, but they don't understand what Marta was saying. And that is that opening up trade creates uh, regional value chains. For example, the fact that what uh, NAFTA and USMCA 
have formed is a regional value chain where goods cross borders more than once. Because as Martha was saying, a car is produced with many, many different parts. So it's fine to look at intermediate goods, but to reach that final car, you have some people producing the engine, other people producing other things. And that is the new trade. It is an intermediate trade of goods, which is different from mercantile times, which was a hundred years ago. And that was basically trade in finished goods. Now it's more trade in intermediate goods. So I can try to produce the finished good, or I can try to produce an intermediate good that can be used as an input in another finished good. Now, why do I have to produce helicopters if I can just make rotors? And that would mean that there is greater specialization. And I think that we as academicians have failed to explain this. And policymakers have also, to a certain extent, failed in explaining this to our general population. But also you have to understand that uh, we're still learning about this. And so the fact that we have access to new technologies, to new and more data, means that right now we know a bit more. Perhaps we're not reinventing the wheel, but we have to organize ourselves to do more studies so as to understand what the direct impact is of international trade. And then based on those studies, look at what needs to be done instead of improvising. So it seems to me that that could be a way forward. Now, there's another thing having to do with trade, and that's reciprocity. And I put that on the table because we tend to see the effect on of trade agreements to say, okay, what happened? But there's always the idea of reciprocity behind them. If I talk to you, you expect something from me. And that has to be the discussion. And what Marta was saying about revising, reviewing agreements, that uh, comes to mind. And reciprocity can change across time because I may begin to produce and I export more than I ever affected, ever expected, or the other way around, I produce and express less. So that reciprocity has to be kept in mind. And another important thing is what is the short-term effect and how do you re-examine that? Now, you, act, you talked about the young people. Don't lose hope with the data that exists. We young people understand that we stand a lot to lose in terms of the benefits of free trade. Thank you, Lorenzo. My third question goes to you, Madam Ambassador. First of all, the comments on the USMCA were very enlightening. I hope that all of the trade ministers are with us today because it's clear that there are some very important lessons in your remarks. But let me go to my third question. And here I would invite you to continue with what you were saying about structural funds. But the question, you talked about a challenging environment, everything having to do with the, the political economy, the fact that recently there were elections where the candidates who won were from political parties that are skeptical in terms of the benefits of trade and integration. So what would you say in terms of a strategy? What type of integration agenda do you think we could follow in the region to preserve the accomplishments of several decades, more than a half a century of integration efforts, but perhaps move ahead bit by bit and to the extent possible. You're very right, Mauricio. I would say, and I learned a lot from what Lorenzo was saying, he speaks more 
from an academic standpoint, I speak from the standpoint of diplomacy and policy, but in terms of the region, this is an issue where I think that the main challenge is that there is no regional strategy. And the question is, can there be a regional strategy when Latin America has been split in recent years in terms of the economic model to be followed, yes or no. So right now, I don't think that things are right to design a regional strategy regarding trade integration. So what I would say is that we could have a vision we could craft a strategy with several dimensions. And that first dimension would be what is feasible. One recommendation that the former ambassadors to the United States made and the ambassadors of the United States to Mexico, we meet every year in a forum. Our recommendation was how could we update CAFTA so as to bring all CAFTA countries into the USMCA agreement with the idea of increasing, expanding the trade integration area, but by creating greater economic integration, we would be addressing the root causes of migration. So this is something that may be more feasible in the short and medium term than talking about regional integration that would go from Alaska all the way down through Canada to the tip of Argentina, including the Caribbean. So Mexico, Colombia, Peru, Chile could work with the Pacific Alliance. And this could be very interesting because the Pacific Alliance was created when there were administrations that were more closely identified with neoliberalism. And now we all have leftist governments in those countries. So the question is, will the Pacific Alliance transform their agenda in terms of integration? Because in terms of trade flows, the agreement has not been all that successful. Trade amongst the four countries really has not gone up as had been expected. But perhaps the Pacific Alliance could put forward a more social integration proposal, looking at a redistribution analysis. What type of public policy would have a redistributive effect without affecting free trade principles? Or how could we incorporate those who have not yet profited from free trade? How could they be made part of those free trade mechanisms? And I think that that points to an important role for the IDB in terms of developing studies along with other regional organizations, as well as financing projects or specific cases as part of the social agenda. Then we have the Mercosur process. And here, what we have to ask is, in the future, could there be a partnership? Could, be, could there be a negotiation between Mercosur and the Pacific Alliance? That's a question. And I would say that could be a first way of producing convergence in this regional trade integration. Now, I believe, and perhaps I'm wrong, but I think that a major integration project for the entire hemisphere right now would be difficult. It would be hard to start a negotiation on that, but it is important to strengthen the regional integration efforts. Now, also with the example of USMCA, perhaps we could have a dimension, a, a negotiation, I'm sorry, that includes a social dimension. We could look at labor rights, environment, everything having to do with mining, respect for the rights of indigenous peoples and their territories. So I think that all energy transitions in the hemisphere 
would have to take into account the territorial rights of the native populations. So that is uh, very clear. Another issue, something else that comes to mind, something that I think could be worked on, is in addition to this social agenda on the part of IDB, would be including the gender perspective, also small and medium-sized enterprises. And in that connection, USMCA could be a reference point. Now, I'm certain that the IDB, well, it's not that I'm certain, it's uh, something that I do know definitely, but I know that the IDB is working on these things, but perhaps it could provide a regional perspective. And then lastly, I'm sorry, Ambassador, I'm sorry, I'm being told that we're short on time. Okay, let me finish my sentence. The IDB needs to study the possibility of making regional loans, and I will conclude with that. Thank you. So very quickly, I call on Lorenzo for one final question, and it is clearly related to the second question, and it is that integration agreements, international trade agreements in general, have become the whipping boy of everything, even uh, uh, pandemics, uh, diseases, even divorce. So from the academic perspective, would you say that this type of attitude is justified? Just a couple of minutes. Shocks adversos la economía, shocks económicos tiene. Well, economic shocks, adverse shocks. Just imagine, I remember in Uruguay, when we had the crisis in Argentina, the impact that has it has had on the economy and trade. With trade, the fact that we, as a result of improved methodologies, we've been able to more closely identify the origins of these economic shocks, the impact it's having on this aspect and other aspects within society. So looking at those uh, measurements, any adverse negative shock is going to have a, a ripple effect on the societies as well. So it's the trade component uh, that we obviously, uh, it, does it have an impact on the opioid epidemic? Obviously not in the United States, but it's one additional shock that can have that ripple effect in other sectors in the economy. And as with all adverse shock, it creates other spillover effects. So the, of course, it creates even greater large scale adverse effects from economic uh, impacts. And these issues are not resolved with just trade solutions. We need to look at uh, the, well, first of all, the macro and cultural aspects that trade, it's not that trade is going to address uh, divorce, it's, it has an impact on the redistribution and those who have lost jobs as a result of trade issue are now exposed to other greater pressures, economic pressures, including those that can have an impact on society. These are economic negative effects that then spill over into these other areas. I'm going to just finish up with that. Thank you very much, Lorenzo. I would just like to uh, be able to respond to all of your interventions and con content. I, we could go on for hours, but I've been informed that we've run out of time. And for me, it was very important to be able to listen to you. We've, we've uh, learned a great deal from your um, perspectives. And I'm sure our uh, audience has also learned a great deal as well. So thank you very much. And thank you. Thank you, Marta.
Gracias Mauricio, reciban toda nuestra gratitud por este aporte lleno de información. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm, ho I'm hoping that you really enjoyed the uh, discussions working uh, in, for example, with the private sector, looking at uh, young people that are now part of the IDB Academy, who all of using all of these uh, tools for the 2025 objectives. We've learned a great deal about uh, regional uh, and global economy uh, perspectives. And if the pandemic taught us any lessons, it was the idea of uh, achieving greater integration, working together. One of the most popular blocks that we're going to be looking at now is the career fair. And those who are going to join us, let me just explain exactly what the career fair consists of. You'll, you'll be able to connect from any part of the world to learn how to uh, develop and your professional profile. It doesn't matter whether you're at the beginning of your professional career or any other part of the, your career development. Uh, so here we're going to learn about uh, tools from the uh, IDB human resources team and other staff members. This is going to be a space to get suggestions, recommendations. We're also going to distribute a survey and we're going to look at uh, available uh, job opportunities through the IDB labor and um, career fair. We're going to see how we can uh, enrich our contacts. So please don't stray too far. We'll be back at 1.30 Washington DC time And we also would like to please um, scan the QR code. That will create a digital credential. That digital credential is for you. We want to hear your feedback on the presentations and the content of uh, Knowledge Week. So just pick up your iPhone and just scan the QR code. We're going to be sharing all of this through uh, Facebook and our LinkedIn can contact. We will, so please scan your credential. We want to have your credentials. Yesterday we talked about the digital uh, government and today we are focusing on regional integration issues. You can, again, you can go in through your uh, LinkedIn account, your job. It's just to go, Could get that uh, record of your participation in uh, this uh, event so we can strengthen um, our work culture and we're here to provide you assistance so we will see you in a few minutes as we continue with uh, knowledge week events
Academia Beat. Welcome to Beat Academy together with the Inter-American Development Bank. A space created for you to feel inspired to pursue your professional goals 
while learning from stories and perspective of our guest speakers. Sean bienvenidos y en la tarde de hoy, como les comentaba, vamos a hablar de la feria. De Welcome carrera. today. Today we will be talking about the career fair, and I hope that today will leave with you tools that can strengthen and further enrich your professional career. The opportunities provided by this platform are infinite. Remember that you can have access to the entire knowledge that, that appears on our website of the Bid Academy and that together we can connect in this space from anywhere in the world. That is a huge privilege provided by the technology. It is a reflection of what has been achieved uh, during these uh, last uh, couple of years. Today we have experts and we will look into opportunities together with the Inter-American Development Bank in this IDB Academy. Today, We will have, and remember that you can share this through our hashtag IDB Academy, and we will have a lot of opportunities in order to understand how those that are here can approach these opportunities within the IDB. From 3 p.m. to 4 p.m., you will have the opportunity to, one, learn about the value proposition of the IDB, IDB group, how to make your resume shine and leverage social media uh, to find your dream job, Also, engage with the IDB group experts and well-known speakers. Explore current and future careers opportunities with the bank and also to find your dream job. Before we start, I want to give you some tips to, the most, um, to take the most of our event. The event counts with interpretation services in English, Spanish, or Portuguese. To choose the language of your preference, click on the links for Spanglish, Spanish, or Portuguese. We are sharing these links in the LinkedIn and also on Facebook. Feel free to share the link um, the, of you two streaming with your friends, colleagues, and however, if you want to join the conversation, you can share in social medias who are interested in international development, also inclusion, inclusion or work on projects that impact Latin America and the Caribbean. Now, please, let's start. It's my pleasure to introduce now Dr. David Barkas. He is an organizational psychologist and a best-selling author of various books, including A Friend of a Friend and Leading from Anywhere. His work has been featured in Wall Street Journal, Harvard Business School, USA Today, and several other outlets around the U.S. Es un placer que tengamos el día de hoy al Dr. David Burkus. It's a pleasure to have uh, Dr. David Burkus. Today, he's with us. Uh, he is a bestseller author of various books, the extraordinary speaker, so that you can learn from him. And thank you, Dr. Burkus. Oh, well, thank you so much. Uh, thank you for having me. Uh, buenas tardes. Y lo siento. Uh, that's about the extent of which my Spanish uh, runs. Uh, and unfortunately, the only thing I know to say in Portuguese in Portuguese is no fala Portuguese. So <laughs> that's about it for me. I apologize. But thankfully, we've got some awesome translators. I, I want to spend the time that we have together today talking about something that honestly gets uh, misperceived a lot and may even make you nervous. So, so first of all, if that's you, if you're thinking, oh, I'm too introverted or, or I'm extroverted, but I don't know what to do. Thanks for being a part of this. My, my hope is that we will get some practical application out of the world of network science for you to help you find that dream job. But as I said, a lot of people have misconceptions about networking. Networking makes a lot of people feel nervous. Uh, you know, we all have that person in our lives. We all, we all have that person we could think about. We went to university with them or, or we met them later and, and they seem to be connected to everyone. They seem to know how to perfectly work a room and network and introduce themselves to people. They're always dropping names of notable people or famous people. We all have that person in our life. And let's be honest, we kind of hate them. I mean, not, not hate them like outright, but, but hate that somehow networking and making connections, it, it seems like it comes so easily to them. And then every time we try, we feel weird. We feel awkward. One study actually suggested that asking people to think about a time that they had to reach out and make a professional connection gave them subconscious thoughts of moral taint. Networking makes some people feel dirty, feel physically dirty. Um, so if that's you, by the way, thank you for being a part of that. If that's not you, we still got some things 
going on for you. But it's interesting because when we look at the research and how people are connected, I think there's a reason behind why networking doesn't come naturally to so many people. And the reason, quite frankly, is that we're trying to apply other people's advice. Think about what you may have been told thus far in your studies and in your uh, in your desire and your path to find that dream job. Think about what you've been told so far. It's usually someone else's advice, someone else's advice on how to introduce yourself, someone else's advice on how to shake hands, someone else's advice on how to work a room. And when you collect lots of people's advice, it makes you feel more comfortable. But when you just take one person's advice and then you go try and apply that advice, you feel weird. You feel awkward. You feel like you're pretending to be someone else because you are. You're pretending to be that person in the moment. I believe there's a lot of value to collecting as much advice as possible. That's why I love what has been planned for this career fair section of uh, Bid Academy. But remember that we need to collect lots of different people's advice, not just try and be one person who may or may not be similar to ourselves. And when you collect lots of people's advice, tens, hundreds, thousands of people's advice, we call that data, right? When you collect the experiences of tens of thousands of people, we call that data. And when it comes to networking, there's been a good amount of data over the last 50 years. There's been a a whole branch of what we call network science, people studying the mathematics and almost the physics of who gets connected to who and how to make those connections and how to put those connections to work for you in your own life. And I think right off the bat, one of the most interesting things that we should talk about when we talk about that research is a misconception a lot of people have. Because when I say networking, maybe even when you tune into this, most of us think of networking as the skill of meeting strangers. And I'm here to tell you that networking is not about meeting strangers. That may be a part of it, connecting to people you haven't met, being introduced to people you haven't met. That may be a part of it, but it's not the whole part. Networking is not about meeting strangers because no one's really all that much a stranger. Now, here's what I mean by that. We're going to talk about this a little down the road. The world is one giant network, 8 billion people strong and counting. The, the reason uh, that IDB is able to do the work that it does is because people are interconnected and we can make those connections, build those connections and, and move it towards uh, healing a broken world, right? So we can make those connections. We have that one big network. And then inside that network, we have industries, we have geographies, we have universities, we have all of these different clusters of smaller networks inside the larger network. And if you think about it that way, you start to realize that you're actually probably connected through a couple intermediaries to just about everybody else. So it's not about meeting total strangers because you could probably find something in common with just about everybody. Instead, I like to think of networking as understanding the network that's around you. Remember, we're in one big network, 8 billion people, but then there's the network of where we studied. There's a network of the industry we want to go into, the companies that we're looking to be a part of, or maybe already a part of. There's all of those networks that we're embedded inside. And if you think about it that way, it it starts to get really freeing because one, you're not meeting strangers anymore, but you start to realize that it's not actually about you. It's about this whole community of people and how you find your role inside of it. And that's a whole lot easier if you think about it. So what I want to do today is I want to take more of that research like we just talked about in the world of network science, the top insights that we've found as we study the the entire world and how people are connected to each other, the entire uh, discipline of network science. I'm going to take, I'm going to share three insights from the world of network science, what they mean, give you kind of an example of why they're so important to finding your dream job and then give you some practical ways you can get started leveraging those insights. All right, so let's get started. The first one, it may be one you've already heard before, is this idea of finding strength in weak ties. Finding strength in weak ties. What does that mean? Well, not every connection in every network is built equally. I mean, you know this because you have people that you're closer connected to than other people. We have a really close friend group, a really close colleagues group, a family group. We are much better connected to some people than we are to others. Turns out in network science, we have a term for that, right? Those close-knit ties. We call those strong ties. Your strong ties are the people that are tightly connected to each other. It's the friend group that you had in university. It's maybe the people you're most connected to and looking for that, that dream job. It's your family. It's all of those close people. The problem with all of these close ties, though, 
is that strong ties, while they're great for bonding, they're great for having somebody you can relate to, they're great for social support, they're really great to turn to when things go wrong. The problem is when it comes to finding new information, new ideas, new potential opportunities, uh, new pathways towards that dream job, it, strong ties aren't really all that helpful. I mean, look at the, the diagram of the strong tie that I just put up to my, um, to my left. What you see is that you're connected to a tightly knit group of people who are often connected to each other, right? If person A knows person B and person B knows person C, there's a really good chance that person A and C are already connected to each other. And there's a really good chance that what A knows and B knows, C already knows. There's not a lot of new knowledge in these strong ties. And like I said, these are great for bonding. These are great for having social support, but for finding new information, not so much. In network science, by the way, if you're wondering, the super nerdy term for this is transitivity. Although some network scientists will actually call this redundancy. In other words, certain people in your network are redundant because they only have access to the same information or the same people that you already have. But these are not the only ties you have in the network around you. There's other types of ties that we study in the world of network science. One, the one I already referenced, is what we call a weak tie. And then there's a special form of weak tie we'll call a dormant tie. More on dormants in a second. So a weak tie is people you don't know that well, right? If a strong tie are the people you're tightly connected to, a weak tie is someone you're not so tightly connected to. That person that you have in class and you know their name and you might know their major and a couple of things about them, but that's it. You know, I, I like to joke when I work inside of corporations that weak ties are the people you know, but you only ever see them at like all company gatherings. You've never actually worked with them. Weak ties are those people that live in your community that you know and they know who you are, and but you don't really know that much about them. You're friendly. They're not strangers, but they're not good, good friends. And then yeah, inside of weak ties, there's another form of tie we call a dormant tie. Now, dormant ties are the people you know, and maybe you knew really well at a time. But for some reason or another, that relationship fell by the wayside. You, you stopped staying in touch with them. You, you stop sharing information with them. Maybe it's been three months, six months. Maybe it's been a year or longer. These are people maybe you went to primary school with, but you haven't seen since you started university. These are people that maybe graduated out a year ahead of you or two years ahead of you. So you haven't had the chance to talk to them in a while. And when it comes to new information, new ideas, pathways towards that dream job, it turns out that weak ties and dormant ties are far more effective for finding that new information. Why? Well, look at the diagram. They're connected to their own group of strong people that you're not connected to. They're somewhere else in the network, farther away from you, which means they have higher chances of being connected to the people that would provide you new information. They probably have new information for you right off the bat, right? And they have new potential opportunities and new leads. You don't, there's no transitivity in a weak tie or a dormant tie because they've been operating in a different community, operating in a different part of the network. And so they become a powerful source for that. So what we mean when we say finding strength in weak ties is understanding that if you just keep talking about your search, if you just keep talking about your career aspirations to the same tight knit group of people, they're gonna run out of opportunities to help you. But if you start telling your weak ties and you start reaching back out to your dormant ties and telling them they have a better chance of connecting you with the people that may be able to help you find the path towards that dream job or, or, or a path to an introduction to that dream job. More on that idea in a second. If I think about the power of weak ties or dormant ties. And my favorite story of this, my favorite example of this is the story um, of Dana White and Lorenzo Fertitta. Dana White and Lorenzo Fertitta. You may not recognize those two names, but you may be familiar with what they popularized. So those are two of the three founders. Eh, founders is the wrong term, but two of the three people who were in charge of running the Ultimate Fighting Championship, the premier mixed martial arts league in the world, and the two people most responsible for mixed martial arts, MMA, becoming the fastest growing sport in the, on the planet for about 20 years. And what a lot of people don't know is that Dana White and Lorenzo Fertitta, Dana is the bald headed president you may see in press conferences and that sort of thing. And Lorenzo was the main investor behind the UFC. What a lot of people don't know is they were high school friends. They were dormant ties for a long time. They went to high school together in Las Vegas and they became dormant. Okay, well, they became dormant ties because Dana White got kicked out of that high school. Uh, we won't go into why, but he was kicked out of that high school and he was sent um, to go live with his grandmother on the other side of, of the United States. And so they fell out of touch. 
And while they fell out of touch, Lorenzo and his brother Frank uh, kind of inherited their family's casino business. And Lorenzo got involved because of the events going on in the casino, got involved in the boxing community, becoming a regulator and a, and a member of the Nevada State Athletic Commission that regulated boxing and, and other sports. And Dana moved to Boston and became a, a trainer, a boxing trainer, and then later, later a, a mixed martial arts trainer, an agent for people who wanted to enter prize fighting, either in boxing or in mixed martial arts. And then about 10 years after they both graduated from high school, Dana flew back to Las Vegas to attend the wedding of uh, a mutual friend of both Dana and Lorenzo's. And they reconnected at that wedding. I don't know for sure, but I like to picture them kind of, you know, at the wedding, going up to get food from the buffet and they see each other and they haven't seen each other in 10 years and they catch up and they find out that they're kind of both lightly involved in, in um, combat sports. They both practice Brazilian jiu-jitsu. Um, so they both have all of these mutual loves. And unlike a lot of us, right, they can reconnect for a moment, but they stay connected. And as a result, about two months after they connected, Dana, through what the work that he's doing, found out that the original founders of the Ultimate Fighting Championship were running out of money. The sport was having a tough time getting regulated. There weren't as many venues who wanted to host the sport as possible. And so Dana called his new old friend, Lorenzo, and he said, hey, I think the UFC is for sale and I think you should buy it. And, and they did. They spent about $2 million to buy it. The Fertitta brothers, because of their family fortune in the casinos, they uh, dropped another maybe $40 million in investing in it over the course of 20 years. But over the course of 20 years, that investment turned into the fastest growing sport in on the planet, turned into when they sold it uh, a couple of years ago, they sold it for $4 billion to a group of, of investors, $4 billion. If, and by the way, if you're wondering, when George Lucas sold the Star Wars franchise to the Walt Disney Company, uh, that was only sold for $2 billion. So twice as lucrative as selling the entire Star Wars franchise. All right, so you might not be, you're like, I, I can't promise you you're going to meet someone you used to know, re reconnect and be able to find a, an opportunity to make billions of dollars or hundreds of millions or even millions of dollars. But what I can promise you is that there's new information in your dormant and weak ties that you're not aware of that will change, dramatically change your job search, that will dramatically increase your chances of finding that dream job. And so I have some homework for you. I'm a business school professor by, you know, by training and academic by training, so I give homework. Here's my homework, pick five weak ties. Pick five people you uh, haven't talked to in depth for a long time or five people you haven't talked to uh, in, a, in a long time, right? Pick five people. You probably already thought of two or three people as I was talking, as I was telling the story of Dana White and Lorenzo Petito, or as I was mentioning uh, people the, describing what a weak or a dormant tie is. You probably already thought of a couple. Think of a few more. Pick five and then I'll give you, uh, I'll give you this week off, but next week, start of July, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, reach out to one of each of those five. You know, why I give you that time is if you have their names in front of you, you'll think of reasons between now and Monday why to reach out for them. You'll, you'll find an article that makes you think of them and you could send it to them, or you'll think of a memory that you can use and just say, hey, I was thinking about this. If you can't think of anything by Monday, then you have my permission to pull this trick. Just send them an email or a text message or call them and say, I was thinking about you today, and it's been a while since we talked. I hope you're well. That's all. I was thinking about you. I hope you're doing well. Now, it's not a lie. You were thinking about them. I told you to think about them, so it's not a lie. And, and I hope you're well. And see how that turns into the jumping point of a conversation. What are you up to? What am I up to? What are you looking to do? And we're going to have this whole conversation. You may think, oh, I haven't, I'm so young. I haven't been around long enough to have all of these weak ties. What are you talking? But you do. You have former classmates. You have people who graduated ahead of you and are dormant ties. And maybe they're working in certain companies and certain industries that you want to know more about. You have family connections and connections from the community that you're in that you really haven't dug into in a long time. So you have those connections. And so now's the time. Make that list of five and start reaching out to them. All right. So that's principle number one. Find strength in weak ties. Homework number one, pick five weak ties and make a point to reach back out to them next week. The next uh, idea from this world of network science I have for you is make sure that you see your whole network, including the fringes. 
Now, fringes is my term, but you heard me earlier reference this idea that we're all one interconnected network, 8 billion people on this planet that are all actually interconnected. That's true. The research for that comes from what we know as six degrees of separation. So this is a, a fascinating series of studies that have been replicated over and over and over again to find that the entire world really is connected, interconnected. And at most, it takes five to six introductions to get a path from any one person to any other person, right? So five or six introductions and someone anywhere in the world can run into and get connected to someone elsewhere in the world. Now, I'll be honest with you. I'm not actually all that interested in, in getting to know any random person in the world. I, I'm not. I think it's fascinating, right, that, that 8 billion people, it would only take four or five, six introductions. And by the way, the research is really interesting on this. If you're involved in social media, uh, like you, you already have your LinkedIn account set up, you're already starting to work it, you're actually only four. So get started on that as quick as you can, by the way, because it's going to dramatically shrink those number of intermediaries. But like I said, I'm not actually all that interested in it because I'm kind of interested in the math behind this principle. If 8 billion people are connected to each other through five or six introductions, Think how many millions or hundreds of millions of people are potentially in range of getting connected by just one or two introductions. You probably, this is why I think networking is not about meeting strangers, it's about understanding where you are in the network. You're probably only one introduction, maybe two introductions away from anyone you need to get connected to, to get connected to your dream job to get an opportunity to at least interview for your dream job. You probably have everyone there. When you really examine your whole network, you probably have everyone there. Well, how do I know this? Because I see it happen almost every single day. I see people who are willing to reach out and, and find and explore the fringes of their network, finding connections they didn't plan on. Now, a lot of people use this information poorly. A lot of people will identify a specific person or a specific company and they will then go on LinkedIn or go on some other social media account, and they'll try and find a direct path to that one person, just that one person. And in doing so, they run into a couple problems. The first is that one person may not want to be connected to you, but there's so many people and so many different organizations that can help you. And so you run into the dead end of that one person, but there are other people, maybe in the same company, the same industry that could help you. The other is that it does require an introduction. And so there's this little tricky element that I'm going to teach you um, that gets around this idea, because one of the challenges we run into, especially early in our careers, is that every introduction is also a recommendation. Every introduction is also a recommendation, meaning when you're asking someone to introduce you to someone else specifically, what you're actually asking for is for them to recommend you to that person. And as long as we recognize that, we can work that to our favor. We can make ourselves work uh, worth recommending. We can mention the things that we, the reason we want to be connected to them and how we might be able to create value through that connection, et cetera. Or if you're especially in this role, we can play the student card. We can talk about how we're just looking to learn. We're just looking to explore more. And could you talk to me for 30 minutes about what you do and and how somebody who wants to do what you do could get started. Just asking for advice instead of, you know, would you please hire me can work a whole lot better. Uh, let me get, let me pause. I'll, I'll teach you the trick in a second, but let me give you an example of how this works. It's the story of um, um, a brilliant mind, a woman named Michelle McKenna Doyle, Michelle McKenna Doyle. Michelle McKenna Doyle was a, the chief information officer at the National Football League, United States National Football League. So American rules football, not football, sorry. Um, but I'm an American, so we'll talk about it for a little bit. But Michelle wasn't always that way. Michelle was actually, you know, she ra was raised in a football family. All of her, she was the only daughter, had multiple brothers. All of her brothers played football. Her dad had played football. Her dad coached all of her brothers. They played for various different colleges, mostly the University of Alabama. They were big Alabama fans. Um, and their dad was actually certain that one of his kids one day would make it into the NFL, the professional leagues for football. And Michelle took a little bit different path. She didn't go to the University of Alabama. She went to Auburn, which is a huge rivalry. <laughs> but she went to Auburn. She was sort of lightly involved in athletics, but mostly she studied accounting. 
And she got hired coming out of college for an accounting firm. And eventually that role turned into more of an IT role as, as information technology was growing as an industry and as a potential career. She eventually became the chief information officer for a couple of amusement parks based in the United States, Universal Studios in Florida, for example. Um, and she became uh, the chief information officer of an energy company uh, based in Washington, D.C. And then a really interesting thing happened because she was still always interested in American rules football. And so one day she was on the NFL website, checking fantasy football stats of all things. And she found a job posting and it was for a vice president of information services, information technology. And she looked at it and she thought, oh, that's really interesting. That, that sounds like a lot of what I do, but, but it should be a chief information officer role, not a vice president role. And now this is a sophisticated thought, but it put it out of her mind. Until a couple days later, when someone else sent her the same job posting, said, I saw this, I thought of you. And they talked about how, oh, you know, this should actually be a CIO role, so maybe it's not worth going at. But now the idea wouldn't leave her alone. So she started exploring the fringes of her network, just out of curiosity. She saw, well, okay, what, what could I do if I wanted to go for this job? So she reached back out to a bunch of old connections that she used to work with, um, connections at the Universal Studios, connections at the, at the energy company, a lot of different connections. She found someone she used to work with uh, five or 10 years ago. So a dormant tie, if you're keeping track of the lingo, who now worked for a major executive search firm. And she asked them, hey, I'm trying to track down who's connected to this. Are you working on with this search firm? Are you working with the NFL to find an executive? And her friend, her old friend, her dormant tie said, no, I'm not, but I know who is. Let me introduce you. So if we're keeping track, we have one dormant tie and one introduction. And now Michelle is talking to the person in charge of the search for this particular role at the NFL. Now, now uh, after that introduction, she finds herself in the executive boardroom with the NFL, convincing them that, no, you don't need a VP. You need a chief information officer and you need it to be me. And she does. She gets the offer. She became, when she started, the highest paid and highest ranked women, woman working for the NFL ever in the history of the, the organization. Highest paid female executive ever, highest ranking female executive ever, ever. But more importantly than that, her daddy finally got to watch one of his kids make it into the NFL, which I think is just awesome. And I think there's a, I mean, it's a cool story for sure, but there's a lesson in how Michelle went about that search. She didn't look up the commissioner of the NFL or some other executive on LinkedIn and then go spam them with an email message or, or try and beg someone who served as their intermediate connection for an introduction. She took a wide posture and said, asked lots of different weak and dormant ties. Hey, who do you know that might be connected to this? And that's our lesson, right, for how to explore the fringes of our network. Don't just chase down one specific um, person, one specific company. Instead, ask yourself, who do you know in blank, right? Who do you know in blank with blank being the company, the industry, the region, whatever it is you're looking to get better connected to, wherever your dream job is, however you could get one step closer there. We're looking for that blank. Who do you know that works in the energy industry? Who do you know that works in the developmental bank? Who do, you, who do you know that works in whatever it is you're trying to get connected to? And ask out of lots of people as you're reaching back out to those weak and dormant ties, if they're potential um, connections to this. Don't ask for a specific introduction. Just ask, who do you know in blank? Now, here's why. And reason number one, it's, it runs with this idea that every introduction is also a recommendation, right? Because what you end up getting at is you're not asking anyone for a specific introduction. You're asking them for a couple names. Just do you know anyone who works in this? And what I found over the years is that people usually won't mention names of people they're not comfortable introducing you to, right? So if you ask that, you say no one, that could mean no one, it could mean no one introduced you to. But if you ask that and they give you a name or two names of people you might want to get connected to, it's really easy to ask as a follow-up question, would you be comfortable introducing to them so I could talk to them for 15 or 30 minutes uh, about this industry or about that company? Because they're usually not going to give you names they're not already comfortable introducing you to. So it's a nice natural flow. The other thing it does is like Michelle McKenna Doyle, it takes an open posture. You don't ask this of one person. You ask it of lots of different people and you get lots of different names. And by the way, if the same two people give you the same name or the same few names, that's a really strong indicator that you should probably get connected to those people through one of those intermediaries, whoever's most comfortable. 
So who do you know in blank? This is the next question, right? Pick five weak or dormant ties, start reaching out to them. But also as you're starting to learn about and wanting to know more about certain industries, certain companies, um, certain nonprofit organizations or NGOs, start asking who do you know in whatever it is you wanna know more about or get better connected to and watch as people give you names or at least give you, well, you should talk to this person and you should ask them. Taking that open posture will get you a whole lot further than just trying to find one path to that specific thing. Who do you know in blank? You may also, if you're thinking about this early in your career, you may want to think about it as who do you know studying blank, right? So your early, early academic career at the university, maybe it's people further down the line, or who do you know who did study this, et cetera, they're looking for information about, right? I really like this, who do you know in blank question, because it's an open question that helps you explore the fringes of your network. Okay, last idea I have for you, and this one is less about ex exploring your network and less about reaching back out to people you're already connected to, and more about what to do when you're talking to people, when you're meeting someone for the first time, or you've been introduced to someone for the first time. And that is that you can build stronger ties to those people through multiplexity. Okay, that's a really weird word, especially, you know, if you're, <laughs> I'm forcing translators to now think of a word for multiplexity. Multiplexity is a term in network science that really just means multiple ties, multiple contexts for connection, multiple reasons to be connected to someone. See, here, here's what I mean. In the early days of network science, we used to study communities, we used to study companies or the whole network. And anytime one person would know someone else, we just draw a line between the two people. Person A knows person B, we'll draw that as one line. And we never really paid attention to why person A knows person B or the multiple reasons person A might know person B. But over time, we realized that we needed to account for that. You see, there's certain people in your life you know for more than one reason. You, you, know, you know some people because you had class with them, or you know some people because they, they live in your community. You know other people because you have class with them and their extended family. You know, when you get into the, in the job, you'll work with some people and that's your connection, but you'll work with some people who maybe you go to church or temple or synagogue, you know, synagogue or, or mosque with. You'll work with certain people and, and you'll have kids who end up doing the same thing down, down the road. You have kids who end up doing the same sports or, or go to the same school. We have all of these different reasons. Maybe it's just that we're connected to someone because we went to school with them, but we also love the same um, musical band or we love the same uh, football team, right? We love the same sports team. We have different contexts for connection, different ways we build connections to people, right? And as we started to account for that, we started to find some fascinating, just knowing someone because of one context and knowing people because of multiple different contexts. For example, multiplex ties are the beginning of how we build friends, how we build friends in our industry, in our community, how we build friends in whatever company we end up going to work with, um, how we build friends in you. We usually build friends because we have multiple different things in common with them, not just one. That doesn't mean it doesn't happen, uh, but because we have multiple different contexts for connection. We end up staying in touch with them more often, even if they become sort of a dormant tie, they're one we can check in with every once in a while and feel like no time has passed. We, we check in with them more often usually as well because we have different reasons to check in with them. Interestingly enough, the other thing we learned is that uh, there isn't really that much of a difference between business network contacts and personal network contacts when multiplexity is involved. Often people who are friends in one context end up doing business together, people do business together, end up becoming friends. It all sorts of uh, overlaps. And I think about the power of multiplexity and that bridge between personal and business and how in our minds we tend to... Uh, connectable to connect people through uh, a, a couple connect into different bucket, business bucket, work bucket, et cetera. And when we do that, we run the risk of ignoring certain opportunities. Hey, here's an example. My, my good friend, Whitney Johnson, brilliant thinker, brilliant author now, but for a time, she was actually the only female I knew that was leading a major uh, hedge fund, a major private equity fund. She partnered with a brilliant man named Clayton Christensen and Clayton Christensen and she started a fund based on companies that were being disruptively innovative, right? Which is something Clayton Christensen is known for in the academic community. Whitney though was known as, a, as an investment mind. She had worked in investment banking for a major Wall Street firm. She had actually lived in Central America and in South America for a long time. Most of her research was around um, uh, telecom companies in uh, Latin and, and South America, but that wasn't why they got connected. 
they got connected because they went to church together. They were both members of the same church and Clayton asked her to volunteer for a certain program that she ended up leading. And he watched her leadership capacity in that one context and saw, you know, I know she has the experience, but it's the fact that I've seen her as a leader that is the reason I want her leading my firm. And so Clayton called her to be the leader of this fund that would invest in disruptive innovation companies uh, and, and end up generating you know, hundreds of millions of dollars. Again, not because she was a brilliant mind in the investment world, which she was, but because someone saw her as a leader in a totally different capacity. Uh, two big lessons from this, right, for you and your life. Well, number one, don't neglect just personal connections in that search for the dream job, right? Because they're the people that have probably seen you the best and, and know how to vouch for you the best, even if you don't have a lot of work-related experience. You also are going to have way more of those connections than you are of, <laughs> of, per, of business contacts if you're just starting out your career. Number two, as you get to know people, make sure you're building stronger ties through multiplexity. Make sure you're getting better connected to them by understanding more about them. Now, this is something we don't do all that well. You know, we're, we're sort of trained in, in most of the Western world when we meet someone, especially in a work context, regards the language, we ask them some version of the exact same question. We ask them, what do you do? Right? So, oh, it's so good to meet you. Hey, what do you, so what do you do? Now, you, you know this question actually a little bit differently if you're still studying in university. You know it is, what's your major? Right? And then they ask, what's your major? And then what do you want to do with that? Which is essentially the same question. What do you do? The problem with that question is it immediately puts people in that work um, bucket. It puts people in thinking of in uniplex ties instead of multiplex ties. It gets people talking about just one domain of their life instead of multiple domains. But if you wanna build a multiplex connection to someone, if you wanna find more things in common, if you want to um, develop a, a relationship with them that's stronger and has the potential to develop into a personal or a business or a both relationship and help you find that dream job, well, then we need to be building multiplex ties. We need to be looking at it from multiple different angles. How do we do that? As you're getting to meet people, ask more than just one question. Here's a couple of questions I like, for example. I'll ask people as I'm getting to know them. I might ask them, what do you do? Um, but I'll also ask, what excites you right now? Which could be a business-related thing, a career-related thing, or it could be something personal. You know, what are you looking forward to? Which is essentially the same question, but it's forward-looking. Tell me that thing you're looking forward to. You can answer business. You can answer non-business. But I'll get to know something more about you. What's something you love that you don't get to talk about? This is a great question to ask someone you're getting to know. Maybe it's at a networking event. Maybe it's through a mutual, you know, somebody, you explored the fringes of your network. Someone introduced you to someone who's in the industry. You want to be part of working for the organization you want to join. And a great way to get to know them as more than just that context is to ask them, what's something you love, but you don't get to talk about? Because obviously you're opening the door for them to talk about something they love, but they don't get to talk about often. What do you do for fun? What was your first job? This is a great question, especially to ask if you're new in your career, you're looking to start your career and you're interviewing informationally with people to learn more about an industry or a company that you may want to go work with. As you're talking to that one person, it's great to ask that. Not only because you learn more about them than just their current job, but because you also help them you know, remind themselves that they were like you one day, right? And not too long ago, at least it feels like not too long ago, even if it was 10 or 20 years ago. And in doing so, they become more likely to want to help you. So there's another trick behind that question. Now, I'm a total nerd. So this last question you see is my kind of nerdy question. I like your superhero um, capacities, not just Marvel movies, but lots of different um, fictional characters with, uh, with, that, are, that serve as heroes. And so my favorite question to ask people, not first, I don't say, hi, my name's Dave, who's your favorite superhero? But my favorite question to ask people almost right off the bat is, somewhere somewhere in the conversation, two or three questions in, I'll say, who's your favorite superhero and why? It's the why that really matters, right? Everyone has something they latched onto as a child. Maybe it's Batman, maybe it's Spider-Man, maybe it's a totally different uh, genre. It's not a superhero, but it's some other cartoon show or some other movie, something they loved as a child. And when you ask them why, you learn all sorts of things about them. Or, or, I mean, or they just, they hate superheroes, but they probably also have a great story about that too. So it's not about the question. <clears throat> it's about the story that you learn when you ask them that question, right? That's the real brilliance behind it. Who's your favorite superhero? Now, I, I realize that's kind of nerdy. So you may not want to pick that one, but pick any of these 
that we placed here. And as you're getting to know people, just sneak one question in. So you may still start with what do you do. You may still start with the basics as you're uh, making conversation with someone, but uh, sneak one of those in. It's one that explores someone from a different angle. I, I like to think of it this way. We want to know, we want people to get to know us for more than just our major, for more than just what we want to do career-wise. We're multifaceted. We have multiple different facets, like a diamond or a ruby, some gemstone. We have multiple different facets that in order to be truly appreciated, we have to look at from multiple different angles. So when you're talking to people, be multifascinated with them. Humans are multifaceted. So be multifascinated with the humans that you're meeting. You're going to be more likely when you do that, not just to know more about them than just what they do, but to find things that you have in common with them. And those multiple things you have in common with them become a multiplex tie, become multiple reasons to reach back out to them down the road, become multiple more likelihood that, which is a weird way to say that, because I really should just say greater likelihood, but become a greater likelihood of them wanting to help you because they feel a more personal connection to you and you wanting to help them too, by the way, it's a two-way street here. It's also about creating value for the network as well. So be multifascinated with them and you'll find that you end up with a better, more robust network than the people who are just trying to be connected to everyone. And it's worth pausing here and talking about the differences in personalities here. Um, introverts, I'm talking to you, right? It's your time. We've been talking for a long time and maybe this whole idea of uh, asking all of these random questions seems weird to you. But remember, it, it, there's some interesting research here that suggests that introverts are actually better at this multiplexity thing. Because remember, introverts don't hate people. They, it's just about introversion versus extroversion. It's just about energy. No matter what your personality is or, or race or ethnicity or gender, like you have a different level of, of comfort, a different level of energy that's drawn or drawn from when you're around big groups of people. But humans are social creatures. Almost all of us like knowing other people, like having relationships with other people. And it turns out that those people who just try and work a room, those people I was talking about earlier, that just try and be connected to everyone, those people who try and work a room, they end up with uniplex connections to lots of different people that end up not being all that helpful. And the introverts who spend time just getting to know one or two people at that networking event, or, or you know, if, if you just follow it up from this entire week with one or two connections, but they're multiplex ties, you had a longer conversation that was more wide ranging than just what do you do and how could I use you to help me or how can I help you, et cetera. You end up better connected to them, right? So, so it's, not about, it's not about an excuse. Oh, I could never ask these questions. It, it turns out you may actually prefer these questions because you're getting to know someone and having a longer conversation with fewer people that actually makes a more in-depth connection, a more robust connection that's more likely to help you down the road. And if you're an extrovert, yes, yeah, still work the room. That's, that's fine. But pay attention, throw a couple more of these questions in so that you can build those multiplex ties as well. And this is, this is important for a couple different reasons. You know, I, I think the biggest, yeah, okay, we're talking about networking in the context of finding our, our dream job, but there's something bigger than that. One of the things I found in, in looking over the almost 50 years of research in network science is that networks have a powerful effect, not just on your career, um, but on, on you. As well, you know, maybe you've heard this phrase, you know, uh, your friend is your future or show me your friends and I'll show you your future or you're the average of the five people you interact with the most. All of these sayings, these quotes around this idea that who you're connected with has a powerful impact on who you become. Well, I'm not here to tell you they're not true because they are, but it turns out they're more true than we originally thought. Well, what do I mean by that? Well, a couple of years ago. Uh, two researchers, Nicholas Christakis and James Fowler, conducted one of the largest studies of a human social network ever, uh, based on uh, one of the largest data sets of how humans are connected to each other ever, the Framingham Heart Study in Framingham, Massachusetts. They built a network of people, a model network of people that was uh, almost 70,000 people strong and progressed over 30 years. So they could see how people get connected to each other, how people fall out of connection with each other, and what effect that has on them. Because this was the Framingham Heart Study. It was a healthcare study. So we started to look at all of these different things. And when we look at those different connections, we found well, we found that your friends make you fat. That was the first thing, that the first paper they came up with. Um, you're, that if you uh, are connected to people who are obese, you're more likely to become obese or heavy, then you're more likely to become heavy. 
Um, but the interesting thing they found is it's not just about friendships. Your friends made you fat, but so did their friends and so did their friends' friends. They found what they started calling the three degrees of separation, that you are influenced by people up to three degrees away from you. So it's not just who you're connected to, it's who they could potentially introduce you to and who they could potentially introduce you to. And they didn't just find it with health like obesity. They found it with things like happiness. They found it with career satisfaction. They found it in a variety of different ways. It's not that your friend is your future. It's not show me your friends and you show me your future. It's that your friend of a friend, and yeah, that's the title of the book, your friend of a friend is a future too. If you pay attention, if you start to understand the whole network around you, and if you start to make sure that you're reaching back out to weak and dormant ties, that you're building multiplex connections with people, that you're constantly exploring the fringes of your network, yes, you're going to be much more likely to find that dream job, but you're also going to find a path to become the whole person that you want to be not just the employee, but the whole person you want to be. Because this isn't just about getting connected to find our dream job. It's about becoming the dream person we want to be. And we do that through the people that we're interconnected with. So I've given you more than just homework on finding that dream job. Reach back out to weak and dormant ties, explore the fringes of your network, build multiplex ties, and build the person with the job, but the person that you want to be as well. So thank you so much for having me. Let me nerd out to you. Thank you so much if, if English isn't your first language for tolerating me for this whole time. It's been an absolute pleasure to be a, a part of this. And by the way, get connected with me on social media and let me know how your homework goes as well. I'm really curious to see where we go from here because this isn't about the now. This is about all of our collective futures. Thank you, David. And now we're more than connected with social media networks. I don't know if you know, But there is a trend on TikTok and on Instagram too, where people try to find out how many degrees have with their followers. So they, they do the, the, like a whole experience trying to find pictures and realize if maybe, I don't know, I'm six friends away of someone very famous. I don't know if you've ever seen that trend on TikTok. Yeah, no, it's, it's super cool. I, I really like it and it reinforces that idea. Um, what I think is cool though, is like, you know, the lesson isn't go try and meet that famous person. It's wow. Look how easy this is. If I just start continuing to explore my network to find those people that can help me in a variety of different contexts. And last question. Um, do you know that a lot of people here is from Latin America and the Caribbean? So maybe they are wondering that if it's possible for me that I'm living in another country to connect with someone in the U.S., for example? Yeah, so th this is why I love a question like, who do you know in blank? For that, and why we mentioned a lot of times it's the geography, right? It's not the company or the industry, but I'm looking to go to that specific region, that country, that city, et cetera. You probably have. The reason for six degrees of separation, the reason we can play that game on TikTok is that people move around. They change countries. People from the United States come to the Caribbean or to South America. People from South America go to the United States for a time. They pick up connections. They come back. And if you take an open posture and you find them and you ask of a lot of different people, you're much more likely to find a warm connection to someone in the United States or to someone in a different country that you want to get connected to than if you just started you know, Googling the names of executives at the company in the United States you wanted to join or the company. You're much more likely to do that through that warm network. So just keep exploring. It may take you a little bit longer depending on how far you want to go, but it's there. We know it's there because whatever country you're in, we're still one network, eight billion strong, but all interconnected. And if you can go back and talk and talk with your younger self uh, in the in a very early stage when, while you're doing your first connections, what will be your ab advice to you? You know, my biggest piece of advice would actually be to do a better job staying connected to the people that you meet. You know, I kind of referenced it a bit earlier in my remarks. When you're a student, people are much more willing to help you than when you're out, especially multiple years out from your career. So you'll meet lots of different people, whether it's through something like this, whether they come to your campus, whether they're friends or family, you know, connected through family members, et cetera, who are willing to give you 15, 20 minutes to talk to you, et cetera. And the biggest mistake I made is that it was sort of like, oh, well, that's not really what I want to do right now. So I let that relationship fall by the wayside only to find five, 10, 20 years later, man, it'd be great if I still were connected to that person. So this is one of the reasons as you meet people to look for those multiplex ties, you'll do a better job staying connected to those people too, because if you know more about them, you know more reasons to reach back out to them and stay in touch with them. Not a lot, but you know, if I had just 
if I had just talked to some of those people once a year, I would still feel connected enough to them. But, but now I don't. I let that relationship fall by the wayside. Thank you, David, for your insight and for being here with us in Academia Beat, IDB Academy. Thank you for being here. No, oh, so, thank you. Bye. <laughs> oh, so for the ones that are here and staying with us in the Academia Beat for the rest of the day, I want to um, let you know that in LinkedIn and Facebook, you're going to find out some links for the content and also for translation in another language. Please join me to welcome our colleagues from the Talent Management Division in the next part. Francis Lafon and Marina Cassiano, and we'll tell you more about the career opportunities here in the IDB Group. Thank you. I think we are on, aren't we? Yes, yep, we are here. Hello. Going to be short and sweet will be uh, to give you an overview of what's available in terms of opportunity at the IDB and a few tips uh, about uh, uh, what to do in order to be a, a successful applicant in this organization. So let me make sure that I'm sharing my content now. Bear with me one second. Okay. Mm -hmm. Do you see my content at the moment? Yeah, it's, it's showing also. Great. Thank you, Marina. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I'm not going to delve too much about the IDB group. I guess that you have received a lot of information about what we are doing uh, uh, in terms of uh, the projects that we are undertaking in the different countries that we are working with. But we are essentially a development bank, but we do not only do loans, we also do grants, guarantees, and research to uh, solve the problems and offer solutions to the region's uh, pressing challenges, okay? If you want to be part of this endeavor, you have to ask about yourself. I mean, first of all, is it something that I'm interested in? And what is this organization offering? So we are offering a number of opportunities, um, different types. You can be uh, either working with us as an intern, a consultant, or a staff member, okay? Um, to give you an idea of numbers, I mean, interns, we are recruiting about 25 in the winter, about 40 in the summer. Consultants, we are literally recruiting hundreds of consultants every year, uh, ranging from very specific short-term missions uh, to, for instance, conduct a research on a specific topic, or cons consultants which are more support functions, research associates um, working with us for the longer term. One thing that you have to bear in mind is that uh, there is a lifetime cap uh, for you to work as a consultant of three years. And three years is also the usual uh, uh, length of a contract that we issue for staff positions. Um, staff positions can be renewed uh, ad libitum uh, as far as there is a mutual interest uh, from both parts to renew the collaboration, of course. So um, Everything is advertised on our website. And then from our website, you will see it also translated into other websites such as LinkedIn, Career Builder, uh, a number of other websites that we use to promote our job opportunities. Um, usually for staff, the, the, the positions are let open anywhere between two to four weeks. Um, the the, the pre-selection is conducted by us, uh, uh, myself and Marina and my colleagues, uh, to, to, to pre-select the candidates that will go to the next stage. Um, usually, you may, I mean, we'll see that later, but you may expect a few, uh, a few steps in the process before you, you reach the panel interview, which is the acme of the process where your fate will be decided, if you will, 
and you will be selected or not for the position. And then typically within a framework, a time frame of three to four months after the position has been posted, we usually uh, have the person on board for a staff position. Consultant position, as you see, are also advertised in the same way, shape and form, um, but the openings are usually for a shorter period of time. The pre-selection is conducted by the department. Um, there is also a, a panel interview, and usually the onboarding of the selected candidate starts one or two months after the, the position has been posted. Okay. Um, we offer a variety of, uh, uh, of functions uh, in this organization. One thing at which I would like to, you to be aware of is that we are a relatively small size organization. We are about 4,000 employees and consultants and staff at any given moment in time. But we are extremely diverse in terms of the, the, the functions that we are and, and the profiles and the competencies and skills that we are looking for. You could be working either in areas such as corporate support or directly related to the operations, as we call it, which is like being really like being frontline, talking to our counterparts in the, in the countries, working on specific projects. So both are areas which are equally interesting and uh, require different skills, of course. Um, on the corporate side, I mean, you see, we, we offer the whole gamut of what traditionally can be found in any given organization. You have accounting, you have communications, you have human resources, IT, and we have a few other specific, which, which tend to be a little bit more specific, such as resource planning or corporate services, which are a bit linked to the, the, the way that we are organized. Um, we also have a legal department, uh, an internal legal department, which is not necessarily the case in all organizations. Um, but for the most part, I mean, this is kind of relatively common uh, and, and standard in the market. Then we are looking at what is, I would say, the front line, the business of, of the bank. And as you see, we are offering a vast array of areas and, and specialties that we are looking for. Um, we are also looking more and more at uh, candidates who have the capacity to connect between different areas. For instance, between uh, climate, climate change and gender, or gender and education, education and, uh, uh, um, and private sector. Um, this is the type of, of profiles and competencies and skills that we are looking for. Not only should you have like a deep expertise in one of these topics, but you also should be able to connect, uh, multi-connect, if, if, you, if you will, to follow the, uh, uh, my, my predecessor, um, with as many different areas as possible. Of course, given that we are working in, in, in countries where different languages are spoken, it is important that you speak English, Spanish, or Portuguese, depending or French, depending on the on, on the area and the, the country that you will be uh, that you will be in charge of. Then, if I look at what our colleagues from the private sector uh, are doing, they are also working with uh, different counterparts, and they are all, they are requiring a number of. Uh, uh, Expertise in different fields uh, can be working with financial intermediaries, infrastructure companies, or small, medium, or large corporate companies involved in the different sectors that we touch upon. Um, then we also offer uh, an internship program, which I think is a good way to enter into the organization. We see that about 60% uh, of, the, of, the, of the interns uh, come back uh, later, uh, either as consultants or staff at any given point in time. So we have like specific requirements for the internship program, which you will find in the, in the internship page and the, the internship description. We have two sessions for the internship program, one in the winter, one in the summer. And each time, I mean, the applications usually start to be receiving about three months before the uh, uh, internship proper uh, starts. Now I'm going to hand over to Marina. Thank you, Francois. All right, so for those of you that are interested in applying um, to our institution, you will <clears throat> obviously need to go to our webpage. Um, all of our positions are posted 
uh, on this website web page for um, transparency purposes. And um, so once you're there, it's our careers at IDB web page. Once you're there, you will see this um, page that invites you to work with us. You can search um, by keyword. So for example, if you're an economist, you can put um, economics on there and it'll kind of bring up all the positions that are looking for economists, for example. Um, and, and then you can also filter by location. So if you're interested in working in a country office, you can put the name of the country office, or if you're interested in working in headquarters in Washington, DC, you can do that as well. Um, so once you do that, you will be taken to the next page, which uh, will show you a list of the positions that are currently open um, and inviting um, candidates to apply. So as you see, for example, in the first page, um, we have a position in Brazil, we have a position in Mexico. Again, we are very, uh, we are all over uh, Latin America and the Caribbean, Caribbean, so you will see positions all over that are um, posted. So of course, yes, thank you, sorry, Fonsa. So once you are interested in the position, you can click on that position and it'll take you to the terms of reference. So you can read a little bit more of that position before you uh, continue applying and you can decide to apply or not. So once you read, you'll see the background of the position, what you what will be required of you for the position um, and, and um, minimum requirements such as what uh, degrees are requested, how many years of experience and so on and so forth. Right, so here we are. So it, um, one important thing that we do mention though is that we we uh, we cannot have so if you already know someone that is a family member that works within the IDB, we do not allow other people from the same family up to the fourth degree of consanguinity to apply. So or spouses for that matter. So please keep that in mind. Um, so then, of course, if you do fulfill all these requirements you, and you are interested in the position, you go ahead and apply. Um, and then. So of course, uh, so how can you stand out? Definitely read about, first of all, the IDB, right? To know more about the institution and then try to find out more about the department itself. We do have a lot of on information on our, on our website. Um, and then also be very specific <laughs> about um, what, on, especially on your CV, make sure you adapt your CV to, to you know, kind of reflect exactly what this position is looking for. Um, so that, you know, we, we really do recommend that depending on the position, you always kind of modify your CV to, to match that and to, and to only show the relevant experience for that position. And always have someone look at it because, you know, it's always, really nice to to get comments or get other eyes to look at your cv because you probably look at it over and over again and you miss something <laughs> so having someone else look at it is always very helpful um, and we do always encourage cover letters as well um, so then yes so once your application ha has been reviewed by our team internally um, and then and and you know for actually first of all you apply and you get a notification saying that you you have applied this is an automate automated email um but then we internally review your cv within the department of human resources um and then you will mostly only be contacted uh on if you are invited to um to an interview or to do a, a test prior to interviews um so what we usually do is we will reach out to you and say, you know, our panel has selected you to move forward with this process. They were interested in your CV. You were a good match, but first we'd like to test your technical skills. So we'll send you maybe a technical test to see how you are. Um, and then if you do pass that technical test or, um, or we do also spark hire videos where we do kind of a short video interview um, where we ask you a couple questions. And then if you do pass those things, you move on to the um, interview. And if not, we also let you know that you did not move forward. <clears throat> so how do you, so we are panel interviews. What that means is not only one person interviews you, we have maybe four, five or six people in a panel that will interview you all together. Um, so it could, it could look intimidating, but it's not, trust me, <laughs> it's just an easier way for us to get everyone on board and everyone to, to, um, to ask you questions. 
um, in one place. So basically, how do you prepare? We definitely we let you know who the panel members are. So we recommend that you do research on the departments of where these panel members are. Um, so that you know where they work, because they might have questions about, for example, if there's a client department that works directly with you related to the position, they will ask you questions about that. Um, always look at the terms of reference. Again, um, make sure you know it inside and out and your CV for that matter. Make sure you know it inside and out so that you can connect the dots, connect your CV and connect to the terms of reference. Um, and always bring examples to the table. So the panel will, will ask you technical questions and questions related to soft skills as well um, that are relevant for that position. Make sure you are brief in your responses. Don't take too long to answer questions. Um, again, this is a panel and everyone will need to ask you questions. Everyone wants to be able to have the opportunity to ask you questions. And we want to give you the opportunity to ask questions at the end as well. So we wanna make sure um, that within 45 minutes, you have had a great chance to present yourself, to show us who you are, and to ask questions for the panel that maybe weren't clear to you in the terms of reference or that interest you about the position. Um, yes, we embrace all diversity. Please be clear of this. We encourage all women, LGBTQ+, persons with disabilities, Afro-descendants, and Indigenous people to apply. So we are EDGE certified and we invite everyone to apply. And that is our presentation. Thank you for tuning in. So I don't know if we have the opportunity to answer or, questions, or right? Any questions that you may have, I don't know. If there is a, a way for us to answer any burning questions that the audience may have. <laughs> No, thank you, Francois and Marina, for okay. your presentation. It's a great to see. There are many areas of opportunity, and our diverse talent in the region is very valuable for you to both. So thank you for being here. For you, uh, for someone that is from Latin America and is here with you guys, um, some, of, some of them are in the early stage. They maybe are not ready to apply to the IDB. So... What do you can tell them um, if they are in a very early stage of their careers? So I think Francois mentioned the internships, I think would be a great opportunity for candidates who are just starting off in their careers. Um, I think an internship gets your foot into the institution and gets you known. It helps you to network once you're in. Um, and, you know, it's, it's, it's a couple months, but many of those interns end up turning into consultants eventually, and some even staff. So uh, we highly recommend you to, to apply to our internship positions. And if I may, I mean, I remember the days when I was just out of uh, school. I had very little experience, very, very little experience. And it's a catch-22 because all companies are asking for some experience because they want to evaluate whether you have the right skills, um, if you are straight out of university, I mean, sure, I mean, you know, a lot of theory, but you may lack the practical knowledge. So my, my recommendation would be to get as much practical knowledge as you can through maybe pro bono work, working in NGOs, maybe setting up your own business. Anything that can help you, I mean, make your CV more robust with concrete examples of how you have been able to implement, use the skills and the competencies that you have learned in the university. Um, that is sometimes a bit of a trick that you need to master, but it's really useful to put yourself in the shoes of the person who is, who is recruiting. Uh, if I have the choice between two CVs, one with very bare, very minimalist with, okay, I've completed my degree, I have had these grades, and thank you very much. Um, I am going to look at the other CV who has this probably maybe less good grades, but this person may have more information and may share more insights about how he or she has used the skills in, in a professional setting. Again, the, the first experience is probably the most difficult to acquire. 
So for those who have zero experience, my recommendation would be not to make it up, but to build it, to build it from the very beginning to from the very bottom. Um, if, you have, if you are young, if you are educated, you are in a great position to give back to society. And that's something that can be done through NGOs, through your church, through your network, through your own business. I mean, if you have an idea, um, that is the right moment also to try it out and fail. It's okay. You may, you may fail, but you will learn and you will build your curriculum and your skills along the way. Um, so don't sit back and wait for somebody to call you up. You have a good education. You have connections. Use them. Build your future. And last question. Some of the ones that are online with us today, maybe one of their concerns is about to speak or not different language. Is that a barrier when you're working with the IDB or they need to learn another language? Depends on the role, but uh, I would say that in our organization, many positions require that you speak at least two languages, um, English and or Spanish being the two lingua franca that we have. Uh, so if you are a native Spanish speaker, I think it's important also for you to become a global citizen to, to learn and, and develop your competencies and skills in English. And if you are an English speaker, I think it's important that you do not rely on the fact that you are already uh, speaking the lingua franca of the world, but to also look into what other languages are spoken in our region or in other areas. Uh, but at least I think it, 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 it will help you also develop a mental agility. Uh, it will also help you relate to different cultures. It will help you understand and get some information about things that you do not know. Um, most information is available in English on the, on the web, but if you want to get a flair of what is being the trend in Brazil, well, it's better to at least, I mean, have some notions. You don't necessarily need to be a super proficient, but at least be able to grasp what is being written or, or to grasp what is being said one-on-one. -on -one. It may take time, but we have a lot of resources those days to do this online. You have a lot of online courses. Most of them, many of them are free. Um, it just takes a little bit of time. One, I, I'm very old school. I'm, uh, so my recommendation is to listen to the radio um, or to follow your, your, your interest. If you are interested, say, I don't know, in dogs, you can read uh, about dogs in various languages. And then you'll get, uh, you'll get to understand uh, a little bit better the language, the grammar and the, and the culture which revolves around this particular language you know, spoken in different countries. If you are interested in, uh, in sports, you can look at, okay, uh, let's, let's see what are the teams playing at the moment in, in, in Brazil. Uh, let's, let's look at the, the, the newspapers about my favorite sport in the different languages. That's a good way uh, uh, to go about uh, uh, developing your language skills. Plus, you also have uh, the radio. I mean, uh, internet radios are, are a very good source to get your ear familiar to how a language uh, sounds. Um, again, it's mostly free. It just takes a little bit of time and curiosity. And that is something that we are looking for. I mean, the curiosity aspect is really something that we are looking for in the candidates that we are recruiting. Um, if you are satisfied with the status quo, chances are that uh, we might not be the right organization for you. Marina. In terms of social media, how important are for the process that you manage or your content is aligned with the IDB? Uh, people are questioned that, that maybe my Twitter is, more, is too political or my Instagram account, it has a strong uh, thoughts about our circumstances. And so what do you think about social media right now in the due diligence? of the new talent that you're trying to approach to the IDB. Marina, do you want to answer that? Given sure. Your so, 
So obviously the IDB is a neutral institution. We do not take political sides in any way. Um, however, when we do outreach to candidates and we invite them to apply, um, we mostly do so through LinkedIn. So we do recommend that you have a LinkedIn page that is up to date um, with, your, with your job experiences and education and so on and so forth. We will not check your Twitter. We will not check your Facebook. Um, however, if you are selected to be a part of, of this institution, we will have to um, request that you do refrain from um, showing political sides and as a, because as an IDB uh, member of the bank, you um, will also be asked to be neutral. Um, so we're not saying you can't go out and be an activist or you can't go out and have political sides. Um, we just ask you to be very careful um, when when doing so. When in fact, we do have a social media um, social media training that we would would ask you to participate in um, if you were selected to be a member of of the bank. Um, and then there, you would be able to see uh, what are do's and don'ts um, for for a member of the bank with social media. But having said that, I repeat, we will not check that if you are applying to positions. We we will only check your LinkedIn and we'll invite you and reach out to you through LinkedIn as well. So I highly recommend that you have that page up to date always. Thank you. Yeah. And when it comes to social media, I mean, one thing I have, uh, I have learned is that whatever you post on the internet will stay on the internet. Um, and one rule of thumb is don't post anything that may offend your grandmother. Uh, just make sure that you, you are not I mean, posting any stupid thing that you will later on regret because that might come and back and bite you. Um, so that's usually I mean being, you, you are entitled to your opinions, you are entitled to sharing content. Uh, only once you have become a, a staff member or, or a, a consultant with the IDB, you will be asked to refrain from taking uh, uh, political uh, uh, opinions because that might imply that we as an institution are endorsing your personal views when your personal views are just personal. So um, just, but, but, but when you are in the institution, you will be given a training about how to manage your, uh, your online presence. So up to now, I mean, while you are uh, in, in, this, in this world, uh, uh, just make sure that you are not doing anything stupid and you'll be fine. And um, any one of you can answer this question. Do you remember an amazing and super neat and clean and lean interview or process with someone? What, what, what will be the takeaways of that experience? Marina, I don't know if you want to go first or... Go ahead, I'll, I'll, I'll follow. <laughs> One thing which I remember, I mean, in a good interview to me is an interview with a candidate who is clear about what we are looking for. So meaning who has done the homework that we were mentioning initially, who knows about what we do. Uh, you would be surprised how many candidates, I mean, do not really know, I mean, could have done a little bit better and that is really impairing their chances. Um, so having the basics in place and then being able to convey a clear message about what is one good at, what is one interested in and showing some good communication skills. I am particularly inclined to say that if your eyes are sparkling while you are having the interview, if you are convinced and you are able to convey your motivation and your interest for the role and for the institution, you will get a lot of positive feedback from the audience. If you are moderately convincing or moderately convinced, uh, and therefore moderately convincing, uh, moderately engaging, then chances are that among the, the, the competition, somebody will be more engaging and, and more able to sell his or her skills. So, Really, I mean, rehearse, uh, make sure that you come prepared, uh, that you have your cheat sheets. Um, one of the beauties of this uh, virtual world is that, I shouldn't be saying so, but that's the real truth, is 
you can have cheat sheets around the screen that you have. You can have your CV, you can have post-it notes, have a, don't forget. How many times have you come out of an, of, of, of an interview saying, oh, I should have talked about this or that? I mean, you are totally entitled to, to plaster your room with, uh, with post-it notes. And of course, too much is too much. So, but be prepared, prepare yourself, make sure that the setting that you are interviewing is a good setting, that your connection is fine, that you... Uh, that nobody will disturb you and be yourself uh, uh, if you are convincing and if you are really genuinely uh, motivated this message will convey and i would just add i mean practice always makes perfect so the more you practice the better and always practice with another person as well um because that person will be able to see things that maybe you're not able to see maybe you're you know you're clicking your your pencil too much or you're shaking and you're not even noticing because you're in the moment. If you have someone call that out for you before the interview, you'll be more prepared and more conscious of, of such things. So practice, practice, practice. And if you have no one to practice with, that's fine too. Practice in front of a mirror and you'll notice more things. Or practice in front of a recording. I mean, you can record yourself yes. and, and mm -hmm. that's extremely scary. <laughs> that's extremely unsettling. Uh, yeah. But that may be able to, to, to show off, I mean, uh, things such as, um, you know, the, the, the times when we don't know what to say and they say, um, uh, we, these, these times, so this will be obvious and then you will, you will realize that you need to work on preparing your, your, your speech and making sure that you are able to convey the message in a very professional manner without hesitation. Um, and concise. As always, <laughs> mm. yeah. right. And 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 some and there was a question about language as well before. Uh, another recommendation would be um, if the posting, if the terms of reference are requiring, say, English and Spanish, practice in both English and Spanish, because you may be asked questions in both languages. Well, thank you both. Um, glad to have you here in the IDB Academy with us today. And all your advice helped me to introduce the next topic that we are going to have here in our career affair. Now it's my pleasure to introduce Eric Schlesinger, career coach and counselor here in the IDB, who will show us how to excel in potential jobs interviews. So welcome to be here, Eric. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be with everyone today. And our topic for this afternoon is that of interviewing. We're just getting our slides loaded here. Terrific. So I think the first thing to consider when we're talking about interviews is to recognize that every interview is probably going to be different from every other interview that you've ever had. Different people ask different kinds of questions, different organizations use different styles and methodologies but they can generally be found in a couple of different main categories. And so I'd like to share with some of that information with you this afternoon, at least to give you some heads up of those possibilities. So for instance, we can talk about interviews that are one-to-one, -one, which means one interviewer and one candidate. And typically those are gonna be a number of those in return. So kind of sequentially, you'll have a number of conversations one-on-one -on -one with individuals. Other organizations use panel interviewing which means that you're going to be facing a group of persons at the same time. Now that panel is probably going to be in the neighborhood of four to five, maybe six people. It may be less, it may even be more. Now the way to handle those two environments is slightly different. When you're talking in a one-to-one -one situation and there are going to be multiple one-to-one -one conversations, you have to be using generally the same information that you're going to be sharing with each person. So that when they talk about you at the end of the day, they're going to be referring to the same kinds of information that was shared between you and each of those different interviewers. When you're interviewing with a panel, you want to make sure you're engaging that entire panel at all times. So whether it's your eye contact moving around, whether you're referring back to somebody who made a comment earlier on and asked you a question earlier on, bringing them back into the conversation is important. Some organizations use a pre-screening methodology. It might be a phone call pre-screen, or now even organizations are using uh, an asymmetrical or asynchronous, I should say, a video conferencing, which means that you are doing a recording onto a video, and that video is then gonna be viewed at another time by the panel members. 
Now, this is a slightly different environment because you're going to be talking into a computer screen. You're not going to get any immediate feedback at the time. So for some people, this is a little bit disconcerting. It's a new situation. So again, maybe practicing in that environment. Some organizations use an assessment center, which means you're going to be given activities to perform. And those activities are largely going to be related to the kind of work that you'll be doing for that organization. So if you're going to be doing a data analytic job, you might be given a stack of data to come up to some conclusions. If you're going to be doing a public relations job, you may be given a number of articles and then to write a press release of that, for instance. And of course, we're also talking about first and second round interviews. If there are second round interviews, that means you've passed that first hurdle. That's very, very good. In fact, having an interview means you've already passed the hurdle of being screened to the interview. But in a second round interview, and maybe even a third round interview, you're not going to be asked those same basic questions. Now it's more likely the case that you're going to be confronting with people you're going to be working with, and they want to know, are they going to feel comfortable working with you? And so that goes on in that environment. Now, there are also different ways that questions can be asked. And so we can talk about a variety of styles here. So there's the traditional, the directed kind of a style, which is things like, you know, tell me about yourself. Why are you interested in this job? What are your strengths? What are your weaknesses? Those kind of direct questions. Another style that's sometimes used by organizations, particularly those that have been training their interviewers, is what we call a behavioral or critical incident approach. In these kinds of styled questions, they'll be asking you things that are going to sound like, tell me about a time when, give me an example of, and of course, they're going to complete that sentence with a piece of information that they're going to want to learn more information about you. So tell me about a time when you worked on a team. Give me an example of when you had to deal with a very difficult client. Right? They are the responses to be, let me inform the people about this situation. Let me be clear about that. And they'll probably follow on or add on questions or probing questions that are going to follow to that. So keeping your initial response rather short will be beneficial. So you'll be prepared for those additional questions that come your way. Another type of question is what we call a scenario question. What would you do if? You know, what would you do if a client called you to do X, Y, or Z? Now, the best way to answer this kind of a scenario question is not to give the philosophical or the academic or the theoretical response, but to give a practical example. So rather than saying, I might do this or I might do that, instead say, this is what I did when. And then you can talk about your own experiences because past performance is the best indicator of future performance. And being organized that way is going to be to your benefit. Some organizations use case interviews where they give you a problem to solve. In this kind of a situation, what they're looking for is your problem solving behavior and your methodology for doing that. And so really what's concerned here is not so much what the final answer is, but what's the process that you use to get to that final answer. You want to be talking out loud. You want to be saying the steps that you'd be going through. And if you're making an assumption, say, I'm assuming this, and if you're using a fact, this is a fact of. So you're being very clear about that. Other kinds of interview questions are what we call stress or negative questions. All right, everyone's familiar with perhaps the most frequently asked negative question. Tell me about your weaknesses. Or do you ever have a difficulty in communication with your supervisor? Or do you have a difficulty working with fellow staff members, with your colleagues? All right, in this negative question, What's important is to move it as quickly as you can from the negative to the positive. To move it from here is the issue to here's what I've learned. To move from a mistake to what I've learned and how I'm taking that forward. So you're trying to move from the, the negative to the positive. And the last is I call a camouflaged interviewing. This is sometimes used in organizations that might invite you for a longer period of time, maybe an entire day worth of interviewing. And you might be invited to go out to lunch with a member of the team. And in that situation, you might think, well, you've been told, oh, you can ask this person any questions you wish to. No, no, no. This is still part of the interview. So be cognizant of that. Don't let it get away from you. All right. So we talk about these different types of interviews and different styles of interviews. If we move on, talk, let's talk about and let's equip you with some basic strategies I think will be of value to you in both preparation and the actual interview itself. So be prepared is indeed the first strategy. What do we mean by being prepared? Well, there are only four things, only four things that you need to be worried about when you're going into an interview. And they are, what's the job? What's the employer? What about the career field? And lastly, about yourself. If you are very comfortable in those four zones, 
largely any question you'll be asked, you'll be able to answer. So when we talk about preparation of the job, it's not just reading the job description, but also trying to understand as much as you can and learn as much as you can about the job in that setting. Talking about the employer, it's not just reading their annual report, if that's it, but also getting more background information, right? Whether it's reading recent articles that might have been written about the organization, checking out again in social media context and things of that nature. About the career field, why would that be important? Because there may be questions that are larger than just the job. For instance, in the world of, uh, of HR, in human resources, a question might be asked, you know, how do you think the, org the world is going to face the changing work situation following the pandemic and as people return to office? That's not a question of a specific job or even a specific organization, but that's a broader question. And lastly, preparation of yourself, to know yourself. At the very least, at the minimum, it means to be fully fluent in your resume. Everything that's on your resume is now open for question because the interviewers have your resume in front of them. And so you need to be equally prepared about that. The next line you see A to B, what do I mean by that? As you contemplate a response to a question, think about where you're gonna start, that's point A. Where do you wanna end up in this answer? That's point B. Draw a straight line between those two points and stay on it. Now that sounds very simple, very basic. And yeah, I will tell you from being involved in hundreds of thousands of interviews over my lifetime, people have a very difficult time doing that. They just get in the flow, they start talking, they start meandering around, they become confused, but even more importantly, they confuse the interviewers. So before you answer a question, think about what you're going to say. Have a sense about that point A and that point B, stay on that line. When we talk about your three to five key points, what are your major selling points for this particular job? You ought to have a good concept of what those are, and you want to be using that information repeatedly during the course of the interview to continually remind the interviewers of your key selling points. Now, the next two items might appear humorous, breathing. Well, of course. But when we're in an interview, we tend to get nervous. When we tend to get nervous, we tend to speak faster. When we tend to speak faster, we forget to breathe in between. We're talking, talking, talking. Breathe. It calms you down. It slows you down. It gives you time to think about what you're going to say next. And certainly the notion of drinking, that is having a little bit of a bottle of water with you or a glass of water, that you can refresh your throat as you're talking. Because in interviews, we tend to get nervous. When we get nervous, our throat gets drier, and then we start to get a little bit concerned about that. So periodically, take a drink of water. It also gives you time to be thinking about the answer you're going to be giving. And lastly, be aware of body language. Interestingly, studies have told us over and over again that the majority of the communication that we're giving, the majority of the message that we're delivering is delivered through our body language. That is about 60% of the message comes from our body language. Lean in, show interest, eye contact, critically important. If you're a hand talker, be aware of that, keep it under control. I always recommend don't extend your elbows. So keep your elbows close to your body so your hands aren't wandering too far away. So if that's 60%, what's the rest? Well, about 30% of communication is the way we use the language. The level of our voice, how fast we speak, how slowly we speak. Only about 10% of the message is the actual words that we're speaking. So all these three elements come together in presenting the communication that you need to be saying. All right, if we move on to looking at some other thoughts, additional strategies to keep in mind, I represent here what I call a model answer. Now, this is particularly valuable when the response to a question is going to be a multi-part answer. And there I would encourage you to do what keynote speakers, what public speakers do. And that is they say, here's what I'm going to say. They list it out. Then they go into detail about each of those elements. And then they remind people at the end of what they've just said. That if you do it in that fashion, what I'm going to say, say it, and then what I've just said. That it will remind the interviewers that you have a full description to be speaking about. You have a full course of information to be sharing. And even if they interrupt you at some point, they'll have heard the full table of contents already, and they know more information is forthcoming. 
The STAR recommendation, this acronym standing for Situation, Task, Action, and Results. This is an excellent way to respond to questions, keeping this in mind. So these four elements, situation, task, action, and results. Now of those four elements, the action and results are the two critical ones. So situation is establishing the context that should be presented, but it needs to be presented in a short form. Don't get yourself too much bottled up in all the details of the situation. What you think is important probably has not a lot of value to anybody else. So always keep in mind you're speaking to others. You have to be thinking about what's on their mind and what information they need to hear in order to understand your circumstance. The task is what was required to be accomplished, situation and task. But then actions, your actions. What did you do in the course of this response? And results, what came out of that? So action and results are critically important, and they provide the two really foundations of these four areas, but the whole notion of STARS, situation, task, action, results, is an excellent methodology to keep in mind as you're responding to questions. Obviously, you want to be showing confidence and enthusiasm throughout the entire process, and to be aware that the interview process actually begins as soon as you set foot into the organizational environment because you don't know who you might be interacting with. So be on your best behavior, as it were, as soon as you enter into the building. And by the way, that behavior should remain in place until you actually leave the building. You never know who you're gonna bump into afterwards either. So keeping that in mind. The next item of always speaking positively about former employers and former colleagues seems like, of course, that's a given. I would never say anything negative about anybody else. But sometimes when we're prompted to, and even if we're not prompted to, we can easily fall into a place of talking negatively about others. That's just not good to do. So always keep in mind, it's the positives you want to be speaking about. I believe that a follow-up correspondence, we label it here as a thank you correspondence, that follow-up correspondence is valuable. It reminds the interviewers that you were there. In fact, I would tell you that that follow-up correspondence could actually take the form of four different elements, two of which I think are absolutely necessary and two which are more optional. Absolutely necessary is to say, thank you very much for the time you spent with me. I enjoy talking to you. That's just social practice. Secondly, to refer to something that happened in the interview to show that you were indeed there. So if a particular topic was spoken about for an extended period of time, that's gonna be a major element of the job. And so you can talk about that specifically. I particularly enjoy talking to you about X or Y, whatever that happens to be, and give another sentence or two about that. So those two things I think are mandatory, necessary to be included in that follow-up correspondence. What's optional is perhaps you didn't have a chance to say something in the course of the interview, ran out of time, so you might want to add something into the mix. Although we didn't have time to talk about, I'd like to share with you this information. <coughs> Lastly, there are times when you may actually want to ask a question to the panel members. And this is, you've probably been prompted to do so. They might have said to you on the way out of the interview, if you have any questions, feel free to contact us. So you're going to take them up on that. You're going to ask a question. But if you're going to do that, please make sure it's a good question because you're, ask, you're asking them to follow up back to you. So it better be something of value, something that's not readily available, that's not answerable in other circumstances. You can't find it on their website, for instance. Let's talk about evaluation. <clears throat> and in fact, the, the areas I'm gonna speak about here should be actually two different people doing the evaluation. That is, they're evaluating you, but you should also be evaluating them. And so what are the four areas I consider to be important in this evaluation? Can do, will do, fit factor, and reality test. What do we mean by each of these elements very quickly? Can do, can this person, as you're being assessed by the panel members, can this person do the job? Do they have the skills? Do they have the ability? Do they have the knowledge to do this job? Will do the job is a different question. That is to say, you might have the skills, but is this really what you wanna be doing? So you're gonna to have to be showing that convincingly to the interviewers as you're speaking to them. Fit factor means, do you fit into the organization? That is to say, is what you want to be a part of possible within this organization? Is there a reasonable belief that 
your fit is going to be working well to this organization. And lastly, lastly is the reality test, which means what are your expectations and can those expectations be met within this organization? Now, by the way, I said these are things that you're going to be evaluated upon. That is, the interviews are evaluating you, but you should also be evaluating the situation. Can you do this work? Do you want to do this work? Do you see yourself fit into this organization? Is what you're hoping to have happen to yourself possible to occur in this environment? Please keep in mind, ultimately, you have the final say. Even if you are offered a particular job, doesn't mean you have to accept it. If you believe this is not the right place for you, if this is not the right situation for you, you can say, thank you, I'm sorry, this is not the right thing for me. So a few other thoughts to keep in mind before we move forward, and that is to, to, to recognize, and a question that's frequently asked to me by people who I'm coaching and interviewing is, how long should my answers be? And here I would give you kind of a general reference point. I'd say 20 seconds to two minutes. What do I mean by that? So if it's less than 20 seconds, it's probably just a yes or no answer, and that's not very good. And if you're speaking for more than two minutes, that really becomes too long. So you have to control yourself, be within that time frame. And so part of your preparation ought to be helping yourself understand what two minutes feels like. For, for instance, take a, a novel off the shelf from your library, have a stopwatch or your phone on in terms of the countdown, and read through for two minutes to see what that feels like and do it multiple times so you really get a sense of what two minutes feels like and then take it down to 90 seconds so you get an understanding about that so you know when you're coming toward the end of your question and response how you need to wrap that up. Okay, let's move on to some other thoughts here. So I'd like to share with you some questions because everyone always asks the questions, what, what are the questions I might be asked in an interview? As I said at the very beginning, there's not a standard list of questions. In fact, there are many books that have been published with titles like the 50 most frequently asked questions. And I always joke by saying, if you memorize those, I'll guarantee you'll never be asked those questions. But what are some typical questions that might be asked? So let's go through a couple slides of that information for you just to look at. So here on this slide, we're referring to what I call the traditional or the directed kinds of questions. Typically, the first question that's going to be asked of you is going to be something like, as you see, tell me about yourself. Why are you interested in this job? What would you bring to us? Why should we hire you? Right? That's an opening question. This is your opportunity to kind of stand on that soapbox and make your presentation. For many people, I would encourage you to kind of have a sense of what you would say in response to that question, not a memorized answer, because you need to be authentic as you're responding to questions in the interview but at least think about the key points that you're trying to make. And you see some other questions that might be asked of you. What's your greatest accomplishment? All right, so we're looking at the positive. We can also look at the negative. Disappointment, strengths and weaknesses. Okay, now let me give you a little hint about the strengths and weaknesses topic. For instance, if you're asked the question about what is your greatest strength? If you're a student of the language, you know greatest represents the singular one. But I would tell you to respond with multiple ideas there because you want to present multiple strengths to the interviewers. On the other hand, if you're asked about, tell me about your weaknesses, then you hear that in the plural, you have no reason to volunteer more than one. And to think about that in advance, which means think about what example you might use to describe your weakness, what weakness you're going to call upon. And I would tell you to keep in mind the following thoughts. It should not be a mission critical skill, right? For instance, if you're applying for a job as an accountant, they ask you about your weaknesses and you say, you know, when I add up numbers, I don't always get the right answer. That's probably not a good skill to share in terms of weakness for a job as an accountant. But more importantly than identifying that item, talk about what you're doing to overcome it how you're working to build away from that weakness toward the strength, or at least to be a neutral factor. And ultimately, even to show how you've accomplished that. So giving thought in advance to what you might say will give you a heads up in terms of responding to that kind of a question. You see some other questions here. What are your long-term career goals? You know, other questions around that the same theme might be, where do you see yourself in five years or 10 years and like? Some people think they have to respond with a job title or grade level. I would say be cautious about that because you're 
estimation of what that might be may not be consistent with what the organization is about. So it might rather be talking about what you hope to have accomplished in that time frame, how you hope to be seen as an expert in a particular area. The question about how would your supervisor describe you is an opportunity for you to put words into somebody else's mouth, right? So here, obviously, you want to be talking about strengths and positives because it's been asked that way. But the question could be asked slightly differently. It could be, say, if we were to check with your supervisor, what might she or he say you need to work on? So that would be another way of asking the questions of weaknesses. Again, think about that in advance. What would you say in that example, in that situation? So let me share some other questions with you, some other particular questions that might be asked. So these are questions that are framed in the format of the behavioral or critical incident. Tell me about a time when, give me an example of, and now you see how the drawdown comes from that. You had to deal with a difficult client or you took the lead on a particular project. As I said earlier on, respond with a short answer, give me a quick description, a quick lay of the land of that situation, because there will probably be follow-on questions. Now, if it so happens that they don't ask you other questions, they're sort of silent, you might ask them, would you like me to continue? But it's always better to ask for that permission than to be told, stop already, we need to move on. When that happens, you're going to feel, oh, I've done something wrong. I've spoken for too long. But be prepared for the probing questions. And so, therefore, when you're thinking about what example to use in response to these kinds of questions, you want to think about an example that's sufficiently robust that you'd be able to carry through a conversation talking about other points about it. And in fact, I use the, the line from the fairy tales, and it ended happily ever after. They lived happily ever after. What do I mean by that? You want to pick an example that has a positive conclusion. So you're going to be able to speak about the results of your accomplishment. Again, remember STAR, situation, task, action, results. If the project you're working on that you spent the last two and a half years involved in, and then all of a sudden was canceled for whatever reason, you have no result. Therefore, it may not be the best example to cite. So these questions, again, are in the form of those behavioral critical incident style. Another set of questions are what we call the scenario questions. What would you do if? And if you remember I said earlier on, you want to respond here by saying, this is what I did when. By giving an example of how you've accomplished this, of how you've overcome this, of how you've dealt with this situation, is the best proof that you're going to be able to do it again. So listen carefully to the question. It's possible that you don't have the exact replica of an answer to give. An example, for instance, if you're asked, you know, what would you do if you're working on a project for the president of the organization? It's due on Friday. Today is Tuesday. Uh, they ask you to have a preliminary report by tomorrow blah, blah, blah. And you remember in your head, you said, well, this guy, Eric Schlesinger, told me I should answer, this is what I did when, but I've never worked on a project for the president of the organization. Don't worry about that. Think about an example when you're working on a project where the deadline was moved up. That's the key element to that question. So again, careful listening to the question is going to make sure that you understand what is the topic that's being sought about, and then to answer accordingly. So all these are those situational type questions. And then we have what we call the negative or challenge kinds of questions. If we look at the first two on this page, for instance, they will probably never be asked of the same individual because the first one says, you've been with one organization for such a long time, why is that? And the second one asks, you keep on changing jobs, why is that? So they're not gonna be asked of the same person. But when you think about your own background, if in your circumstance you've had multiple short-term jobs, why was that the case? Well, maybe they were all internships. Maybe they're all term appointments. Maybe there were projects of a selected and particular time frame. And so you want to say that so there's a clear understanding. It's not that you were released or you were dismissed or you were fired. No, these were term appointment times. The next question, why would you leave your job is really a focus not on your job, but the job you want to move to. You always want to be talking about an attraction to the next opportunity, not a way to get away from where you are. So it's always talking about in the positive, I'm interested in your job. This is what I want to do next. 
not because I hate my current job and I have to get out of it. You may be asked questions about the organization. You may even be asked questions, how did you research us? They want to know how detailed a project you've done in terms of preparing yourself for the interview. Okay, salary may be another question that could be asked of you. And this is a question that many people have a concern about. What happens if they ask me about salary? And I would say the following, number one, in the first interview, this is not the time to be talking about salary because you have no leverage at this moment. So your goal is to try to move away from that question. You know, what are your salary expectations? Answer, I'm certain that your salaries are competitive in the job market. I'd really be interested to share with you more about my interest in this job. And we can talk about salary later on. You're trying to avoid that because most likely they're going to use your answer only against you. So try to move away from that. But if you're forced, you need to be going into this interview with an understanding about what are the typical salary ranges. And so you always want to give an answer in terms of a range, not a specific number, but in a range of information. And then lastly, it's to be aware of questions that you should ask. Because typically at the end of the interview, you'll be given an opportunity. Do you have any questions for us? Now, this is a moment that's critical for you. It's a moment where you can change the whole flavor of the interview. Up until now, the panel members or the interviewer has been very passive. They've simply been listening to you. You want them to become an active member of this conversation. So you want to be asking them questions. So if you're ever given that opportunity, do you have any questions for us? Please never say, I don't think so, or no, I don't. To me, that represents a person who's not interested in this opportunity. Have questions in mind. And the best kinds of questions as you see here are those that are getting the other person to think. I'd be interested in your opinion about, or give me your perspective on, and then fill in the blank to that. But it's going to give them time to think, and they're going to respond to you, and therefore, they're going to be involved in the conversation. And that's what you want to be a part of. As I've spoken to both employers and candidates over the years, and I ask them, what makes for a good interview? Most often they say, it's just like a conversation. And that's the goal. You want them to feel that you've been part of a conversation, that they've been part of a conversation, and that's the positive attribute to it. So with all this information, let me simply wish you the best in terms of your interviewing. This is your opportunity to shine. This is your opportunity to present yourself in the best possible light to the employer. Practice it. Speak to other people, record yourself if that's the approach you'd like to talk, but you need to practice out loud. You need to have your answers heard by your outer ear, not your inner ear. And once again, best wishes to you in your job search campaign. Thank you very much for being with me today. Thank you, Eric. And now we have two questions from the audience. Some say that perfect is the enemy of a good outcome. There are people who, because they are concerned with the form, stop having substance and value content. What do you think, Eric, about this? What could you recommend to those people who are very worried about the form and sometimes are that don't let them be themselves in the interview? It's an interesting question. And I, I think you've actually hit upon the right words is be yourself. That notion of authenticity is very important. So that's what's being hired. You're being hired. If you're putting on a fake front that you think this is what they're going to be expecting someone to be like, and you're going to, you know, you're putting on a false facade about that, and ultimately maybe you even get hired because of that, if that's not the real you, you're going to be found out. It's going to make for a very uncomfortable situation on the job. So you want to be the real you. And I think, that, you know, in terms of the, the perfection and not, it's you want to be giving the best answers you can. But the best way to do that is to be prepared, to think about things in advance, Review the job description, review the organization, review the career field, review yourself so you know the examples you might be able to utilize. I hope that helps out. Of course. If I'm being interviewed, what type of questions should I not accept or could be considered disrespect disrespectful for me? Are you speaking about discriminatory questions? Yes, if, if I'm the one that I'm having... Uh, I'm the one that I'm doing, not doing the interview, but I'm the one that are, are applying sure. For, sure. For, for the career um, open that you have there. But maybe some of the people and women also sometimes consider that some of the questions during the interview should not be there are not, are, or are disrespectful, disrespectful. So what do you think about 
right. what I can do or someone in that place? Yeah, that's a great question. It's of concern to many people. Men and women doesn't really make much difference in that regard. Now, I think in the end, you are the one who has to decide if you're going to answer a question. I, I, I'll, I'll tell you, you know, I've been told by candidates that I've worked with, that I've coached over time, that they've been asked questions that are completely inappropriate for the interview. And sometimes they said, I've stood up and said, I'm not interested in this job. And they walk out of the room. And other people just answer the question. Because if they, even they know it's not an appropriate question, it doesn't bother them. They're going to answer that question. But I think the ideal situation is to try to bring it back to the job. So if a question is asked, you know, are you able to handle this job? Your, your response has to be, yes, I can do this because I've done that. And so if somebody thinks, well, perhaps because you're a young person, you're going to have a family, maybe you have a particular disability, you're not going to be able to handle the workload. No, no, no. You have to present a evidence that you're able to accomplish the job that's been asked of you to do. And so again, past performance is the best indicator of future performance. But ultimately, it's your decision whether you're going to answer a particular question or not. That's a difficult moment. And last, sometimes people don't know how to finish the interview, how to, what to say at the end of it. Uh, maybe I can call you back or write you an email later to know in what part of the process am I. So what could be a nice and neat goodbye for that interview? Sure. Well, obviously, you want to end on a very positive and high note. So one of the questions you might ask at the very end is, what's the rest of the process? So you walk out of the interview knowing what the rest of the timeline is going to be. That should not be your first question, but that's ultimately your last question. But then as you're finishing up, it's to say, thank you very much. I enjoyed talking to you. You want to have a, a positive vibe about yourself, an open smile, you know, an excitement about this opportunity. I look forward to hearing from you. This is really where I want to be. I'd be excited to join your team. Thank you, Eric, for those tips and mastering an interview were excellent. Thank you for being here. Okay, so far we have learned how to network, build, and have a great resume, and also excelling in our interviews. We have one more areas to talk with you in Essentials and how to design your career. So please stay with us because we have our next guest with us here in the, in the IDB Academy. For those who are sharing on social media, please be aware that our hashtag is Beat Academy or IDB Academy also. Our social media presence is very important. Without further ado, I will pass in to Kerry Veles and Camilo Espeleta, who will be with us in a few minutes. So stay with us and we will have Kerry in a few minutes also. In the meanwhile, I'm going to tell you that this, uh, this is only our second day of our Semana de Conocimiento. We're going to be here until Friday. Tomorrow, we're going to talk about gender. And on the last day, we're going to talk about climate change. So if you have any concern, if you want to share your experience, please uh, follow up in LB, um, at L, <laughs> piso bajo, beat in social networks. So we are already uh, prepared to have in our next guest. So Kerry and Camilo, the stage is all yours. Gracias, Veronica, por esta invitación y por la presentación. Thank you very much, uh, Veronica, for those kind words of introduction and for having invite, invited us to uh, and we're very happy to have you following us in the uh, social media and through the hashtag, which is the IDB Academy. And today uh, I'm with uh, Kerry Veles, our social media project manager at the IDB, who is uh, there. These are the hashtags for those that would like to ask questions or provide some comments. We will follow up your comments and questions uh, today or later on this week. The first thing we would like to do is just relate a story that I'm sure you have already heard about this, but this is the story of Chuck Nolan. He's a FedEx executive, logistics company who was obsessed over um, time management. I'm sure you're familiar with this account. 
But this executive had to travel from country to country. And when he was traveling by plane, his plane suffered an accident and he actually wound up a shipwrecked pretty much on an island. He was on a desert island and that's where some key challenges were faced by this human being. He needed, of course, shelter. He needed to be able to have food to eat. And in particular, another major top challenge that he had to face was dealing with loneliness. So I just wanted to share that, his, that story because that story has one component that I think underscores the significance of communications between human beings and how communications are so characteristic of mankind that it really is part of the uh, essence of human beings. So one of the most uh, iconic figures, and actually here we see Wilson, that completely changes the storyline and is basically reflective of the essence of human communication. We begin to see a conversation, a communication between, similar to between two people, two individuals, two organizations. So he begins talking to Wilson. This is a story that came out several years ago and it really moved me in terms of conveying this kind of uh, accounting. Sorry, Camilo, but I think this movie came out a, a little while ago, maybe 20 well, years ago or so, but maybe, I think the message is still stands true. Maybe, maybe 20 years ago. Yes, it was a story that came out over 20 years ago, but I think it still has a powerful uh, impact in really reflecting the importance of communication between human beings and human communication really takes on many different forms. You have all kinds of conversations, sometimes even uh, strange communications, but it's always the, the receipt. There's always a receiver and a conveyor of the message. So it begins to develop uh, messaging structures that allows both parties to develop a sense of where they want to go. Why does Nolan go out of his mind on this desert island? Well, it's because of Wilson. And I think one of the great characteristics of this exercise is that when Wilson is at, when he's finally able to leave the island, Wilson is dropped in the water and is actually floating away. And the, this person begins to yell, Wilson, Wilson, Nolan. And, and he's, when you have a conversation and when you meet with the three key elements of communication, nobody wants to leave, for you to leave. So in other words, we're talking about fulfilling the three key elements that are characteristic of communication, which is to be present, two, to be useful, and three, to be quick. And in the social media, you see these essential uh, components, be present, be useful, be quick. So it's basically all the elements that were a part of Wilson when we had those, we saw those conversations throughout that history. So among the recommendations we want to share with you here is that uh, be Wilson, my friend. In other words, you need to be present, you need to be quick, and you need to be useful. So that's how we want to start this session where we're going to talk about uh, some tips and recommendations to help lead to the next level 
in the communications that you continue to develop in your communications here and especially in such uh, powerful platforms as social media. So Carrie, maybe you can talk a little bit more about how can we better develop these uh, accounts, these stories that we are uh, telling in our uh, media. How do we do Wilson? How do we get that started? So the first thing that you wanna do is you wanna listen to your audience. That's the first thing when you're thinking about which social media channels you wanna use, what you want to do on social media, it's definitely listen, think about your audiences, think about who you want to be, maybe what's the position you want, what are the companies and organizations that you want to work for, who are, um, who are the people that are passionate about the same things that you're passionate about. You mm -hmm. definitely want to find who those people are and start following them on social media, start looking at their conversations, start looking at what they're posting, how they're posting it, um, those careers that you think you want, and then also things that you might think that you uh, that you're interested in, but don't really know how to connect to your career. That'll help you define your social media channels. And you also want to remember that those markets, those things that you're looking at, those industry people you want to look towards, those people who are passionate about the same things that you are, that those markets, they're conversations. Uh, they're, conver they're conversations between people. Uh, they are talking about different things. And that brings us to kind of our next point, which is that markets consist of humans, human beings, and not demographics. It doesn't consist of, you know, those big ranges of people uh, who maybe only focus on that. They're people who have lives, they have families, they have children, maybe, maybe they don't want to have uh, children, or maybe they have different interests, you know, they have different things. It could be someone who works in architecture who also likes rock climbing and they're able to carve out a niche for themselves on social media based on the fact that they're human. And remember companies and organizations, what you want to do and what you want to work for, they're all made up of humans. So it's really important when you're on social media to remember not to lose that authenticity of who you are. And when you're speaking to people, you speak to them like that. Let's explore this concept a little bit more by watching this video. <clears throat> Did you hear that? That's the balance of power changing. We are your neighbors, your brothers and sisters, co-workers, mm -hmm. kids, your grandmothers. We're the driver sitting at the red light next to you, the other passengers on the plane. And now we have the power. It used to be Madison Avenue, census data, focus groups, secret shoppers. It used to be jingles, endorsements, infomercials, coupons. It used to be the customer is always right said those who didn't listen. But that was yesterday. Today, we found our voice. We are strangers, but we are organized. We won't wait for your big data. We want whatever, whenever, wherever. Nine to five? We live 24 hours a day. We are a moving target. We move fast. We are a movement. We are cutting cords, changing the way things work. Status quo, status no. We brought down the taxi industry, but we are not the enemy. We are your opportunity. We are growing, getting better at getting better. We are your path to success. If you can keep up with us, we'll be on the winning team because we'll pick the winners. We are not millennials. We are families with more Facebook followers than you. We are not baby boomers. We are grandmothers who order Christmas gifts from a touchscreen. Gen X, Gen Y, no. We are Generation CX and you can be too. If you listen to us, create for us, join us, Generation CX. So Generation CX or Generation Customer Experience is all about 
being true to who you are, being a human, being relatable. And really you can use that. And what you need to do is find your own story, be open, be truthful, talk to talk about the things that affect you on a daily basis. And so we'll bring us to a quote by Simon Sinek, who uh, is a world renowned author. And he says, people don't buy what you do. They buy why you do it. And so the journey of social media and explaining your career journey over time is super important and it's okay to change and to work through different things on social media, but don't be afraid to try. Don't be afraid to try to tell your story. So let's get started with how do you even find your story? What you want to do is first find your why. What's your purpose for being on social media? What's your purpose for your career goals? So ask yourself a couple of questions like, what do you want to share? Who do you want to be? What do you want your, like the experience of the consumer, which in this case is your future career or employees or clients, or what do you want to show to them? Um, And start asking yourself certain questions about why you want to be on social media. And that'll help lead you to figuring out where you should be, why you should do it, and how you're going to create content. So first, you want to find your why. Excelente. Y según como, como dice Kerry, pues uno de los ejercicios principales es find your why. As Kerry said, one of the key exercises is to find your why. And that way you start to build that message, that message in working with creating that uh, social uh, pact. And now let's build a whole series of recommendations that can help to further build your messages and uh, also continue to craft your professional and personal uh, imaging. Also, you need to structure your messages around specific categories categories that you already um, clearly master or you want to communicate. At the IDB, we have these categories that we're going to share on the screen that are related to leadership, the executive uh, leadership um, that relate stories as to how we're having an impact on the lives of individuals in the region. Then we also have the knowledge category that includes all of our knowledge, content, products, publications, courses, blogs. And then we also have a large category that is the the IDB Academy is leading this category. Then we also look at uh, a third content, which is our impact. What are some of the stories, the accounts that are coming out uh, in and shared in countries, in uh, communities, regions, where the IDB is generating that impact. Then we also look at um, institutional communication through press releases and newsletters. Then we also have a major category dealing with talent and culture that is headed by our human resources team that is constantly generating new information regarding new vacant positions and opportunities that we're providing in terms of employment and the constant search for talent. And this is a part of and makes the core makes up the core of uh, knowledge week. And also then the connections established. How can we work together with multiple entities and stakeholders in order to promote sustainable development in the region? And after having then established these uh, well structured and identified pillars, then we recommend that we develop and define the level of effort sought for each channel. Today, we have an enormous opportunity to have multiple challenges that are well geared and directed with functionalities that will allow people to convey messages to multiple audiences. But one of the key elements really lies with planning, the planning process, and also looking at the level of efforts geared to each one of these um, social media 
focuses. Uh, it's not a question of creating accounts in every media. We need to, uh, unless we're going to create content for each one. The second recommendation is to clearly define the levels of effort. The third recommendation is to identify the uh, those so-called uh, channel superpowers. Each social media has specific functionalities and over time and as the trends continue to evolve we begin to see new functionalities and new ways to use these social media outlets at the idb for example live streams are of crucial importance for our communities to make sure that our audiences are getting a very positive response when we're looking uh, at uh, direct uh, and live events that we are undertaking at each organization. Another one of the superpowers at the uh, in social media are the live streams, uh, Facebook live streams that you're looking at today and LinkedIn live streams, Instagram live streams. And then we also have these live spaces, audio live spaces where we're asking for a uh, response that is representative of these audience groups and then we also look at other typical superpowers that the um, audiences like more you have for example the uh, the tiktok boom the uh, also live stream uh, YouTube booms, all of these are having a major impact and it's not necessarily the same content in each one of these channels. The content that I am producing for this is not going to be the same for Facebook or YouTube. So we have to identify those super channel superpowers and then adapt them and tailor them to the characteristics of each one of your individual audience groups. Also, what are our key pillars and what are those channel superpowers that we already have that are most representative? Well, content in this case is crucial. And as we, uh, well, here we, we know that content is king. But one of the most representative recommendations that we offer is that please don't be afraid to create content. That's one of our tips. We're human beings and as human beings, we're always, um, we're always thinking, what are people gonna think of us? What are our colleagues at work going to think about? What are our bosses gonna think of us? And our future employers. Well, don't be afraid when you're generating content. You can structure the content uh, development to be professional. First of all, look at the content that you are getting on a daily basis. What is the knowledge gained? What about your experience gained in your working relationships, in your um, workplace, in your basic day-to-day uh, -day experiences? That knowledge that you're getting from other sources that could be and are you applying the knowledge that you're getting from, let's say, the IDB Academy? And can you see that reflected in results and processes? You need to be able to do away with that fear of creating content because sometimes we're afraid of feedback or we're afraid of criticism. Criticism is going to actually make you stronger and strengthen your professional profile so you can make the necessary adjustments to the messages that you're conveying just to give you an example let's say you're talking about sustainability or climate change or the amazon region and let's say you're a specialist in bioeconomic uh, measurements and you submitted an article a video in your social media or a post and you didn't take into account some specific exercise on in one of the countries in the amazon region and somebody wrote back and said you know that because of uh, 
the legislation in such and such a country, this would not be possible. Well, okay, you take that information and you continue to build on that, but you didn't know about that legislation. And those criticisms, those uh, comments that are being provided by the community or by your audience, these are essential as building blocks and improving your um, content. This content was done by a student from the IDB Academy. And we just want to show you, just to give you an idea, how, how on his own initiative, one of our students from the IDB Academy was able to describe each one of the uh, phases and steps, the acquired knowledge with the experience built in with applied knowledge, how all of that leads to meaningful results. Well, thanks to um, leader, the course Leaders for Management in Citizen Security and Justice, I am an agent of change. And I am here in Bogota, Colombia. And thanks to this uh, excellent experience and initiative, I've been able to build an enormously successful initiative for my community and my city. Here, the IDB Academy teaches us that citizen security is based on the capacity of states working with the government, the citizenry, and to be able to provide a framework for protection. And here, the bank identified key core elements. One, citizenship, working with also the entrepreneurial community, local governance, as well as the justice sector. And we brought in the, also the academic community. So day to day, we bring that together and provide a comprehensive response to help the adolescents to craft a new promising future. So from one of the most uh, dangerous neighborhoods, we work with uh, uh, efforts to combat drugs and crime at an interagency and institutional level. So I thought it was a very, uh, very nice message um, looking at the results from uh, the knowledge gained in his uh, experience. So, no. yeah, of course. So Camilo was mentioning, don't be afraid to create content and let's get that content started right now. Remember, we had those hashtags at the beginning, Academia Bid, Bid Academy as well as digital heroes. So of course you can share your learnings on your social media channels now. Um, you can create content right away. But one of the ways to create content, there's kind of two ways. There's in the moment content, which would be what you're creating now based on what you've just heard from this presentation and maybe any other presentations that we've had at this Knowledge Week. But then there's also some of our pre-planned content. Some of our pre-planned content makes social media a lot less daunting because what you can do is you can plan out a month, three months, a couple months in advance to try to figure out when you're going to post, how much you're going to post, and what kind of content you want to be sharing. That way there's a variety of content on your channels. Remember to post based on which channel you're on. Don't just do a one-size-fits-all approach. But yeah, that's definitely what you want to do. A content calendar is what we use in the industry to promote social media from, let's say, uh, El Bid or the IDB in English. But there's so much you can do. So this image that we have here on the presentation of a content calendar is from Twitter. It's a really great example of all the different types of tools you can use on Twitter. Um, and some of these tools are also available on other platforms like Instagram or Facebook or LinkedIn. Um, so what you want to do is think about what you want to post. So maybe it's not as engaging as every day that you're going to take time out of your day, especially if you know social media maybe isn't what you want to do 100% of your time is become an influencer. But what you can do is maybe pick two days a week. Maybe it's Monday and Thursday to space it out so you have some time. Maybe it's Wednesday and Friday. And 
what you want to do is plan out what types of content you want. And this helps you because if you want to do a poll on Wednesday and a video on Friday, then maybe on Sunday you have an hour between doing things at your house and you can just kind of think, ideate, create that content and then post it on those specific days. But that way, if your day gets really busy, you may not be a as upset, or if you go a long period of time without posting on social media and you're a little bit scared to jump back into it, it's always really good to be able to just go into it, create a schedule, just add it to your to-do list, take a little bit of time each day to kind of figure out what you want and build it over time so it doesn't feel so daunting. So a content calendar is super important to help you be consistent about your career and your growth. And it also helps you figure out more of what your niche is, what is your career, makes you think about what your next steps are in your career as well if you are using your social media that way, which can kind of be an internal thing that gives you a little bit more insight into what you want. Um, so that's a really great way to work through it. And then once you have that content calendar, you've developed it, you don't want to just put it out into the world, forget about it, move on, post again, you want to measure your impact. And so I'll throw the microphone back over to Camilo to talk a little bit more about how you can measure your impact in small ways that don't feel so overwhelming. Absolutely. Gary, thank you. Um, este es uno de los frameworks que nosotros utilizamos en el BID y es un framework que ha sido desarrollado. This is one of the frameworks we use here at the IDB, and this was produced by the International Association that measures efficiency of online communication. It is called the AMEC framework, and it is important to know where the structure of this framework comes from, but it will help you develop your professional or personal profile. Now, when we talk about developing this framework and developing the way that we measure our success in terms of communication and our business objectives, we have three different moments. First of all, preparation, then implementation, and then measuring all of the knowledge learned thanks to this ongoing communication cycle. So first of all, you have to set your goals as a person, as a professional, or as an organization. Those who have micro enterprises or enterprises that are structuring their objectives, you can have business or organizational objectives, communication objectives. And let's say that I am putting together my personal uh, social media profile because I want to work in a given organization. I want to work for the IDB. So this will be my target. That is my business target, my organizational target. What type of element am I going to communicate and what should be the result of my communication efforts? And that is where you put in the communication goals, the type of scope, the type of interaction with the audience you want to reach, how relevant your message is to your target audience, and you can do that through the AMEC framework. Then also planning according to your audience and how to create a content that is specific to each audience. Now, remember, B. Wilson, my friend, so we have to be present for those conversations where our audiences are present. In other words, we have to be where our audiences are talking. And second, we have to be quick in communicating. You don't have to construct or make a very eloquent presentation. You don't have to invest a lot to be able to deliver the information, the content that you want either as an individual or as a company. And then lastly, you have to be useful, helpful. We all have the experience of receiving information from an organization or a person that isn't all that helpful. It is more a commercial. So let's focus on being helpful to our users or audiences. Now, also, we have the implementation actions where you have a timetable and you begin to identify the content that you are producing and whether or not you are meeting your content objectives. Let's remember 
the calendar that uh, we heard described, and then the quantitative and the qualitative results. In the qualitative results, you identify the exercise of being on social media, and that is to be able to trigger conversations. What you want to do is to begin a conversation with one person, with one community, with a given locality, with a city, with a group of stakeholders that are interested in a given topic. So your goal has to be triggering that conversation. And those conversations are going to make it possible when you begin to be helpful in that conversation, your community will not let you go. Remember Wilson. Your community won't let go of you if you follow the three elements having to do with these micro moments. And then lastly, what are the lessons learned? This is a cycle. You have a communication strategy, you measure the different results, and you understand from the conversations you generate, the goals you attain, how you are gaining insights and how you can continue to move forward. Now, basically, that brings us to the end of our presentation. I hope that all of this has been helpful. Hopefully, it will help you develop your personal and professional profiles. And to summarize what we said, one, create your content pillars, the different categories that will allow you to organize your information. Second, define the level of effort that you want to put into each channel. And third, remember that the different channels and uh, social media have superpowers. So identify those superpowers and set up a content calendar so as to be able to structure your efforts. And lastly, don't be afraid of generating content. Only 5% of internet users generate content, the other 95% are consumers. So you'll be in the top 5%. So you will be powerful if you take that power and generate content. joining us. Look out for us on social media. And we also just want to give a plug to, if you missed the career fair yesterday, there was a really great presentation by a LinkedIn representative, Shira Selkovitz, who talked about the specifics of developing your LinkedIn profile. So if you missed that, head on over to our YouTube pages in both English and Spanish. It'll be in a playlist at the top of the YouTube page. Look up day one, and you can get step-by-step -step instructions on how to build your LinkedIn profile. So this is not the end of Knowledge Week. We're going to continue on and uh, continue with these tips so that we can elevate all of your careers uh, professionally. So thank you guys so much. Bye. Thank you, Kerry and Camilo. Although we are out of time, I want to make some questions um, now that we have the opportunity to have Camilo and Kerry here. Camilo and Kerry, you know that right now with the social media efforts, um, there is two type of thinking. The one that, that I can create content, Camilo, but also how can I be discovered? How can I be um, discovered? Because sometimes people invest a lot of time and effort on the content, but they are frustrated because no ones or not yeah. the amount of people that they want are having a uh, sharing comments or interaction with them. So what can you say in, in terms of that frustration and how can I make some strategies to be more discovered for our other people and other audience? Bueno, como lo decía Kerry en un momento de la presentación, uno de los elementos As más... Kerry was saying during the presentation, one of the most important things in creating content is to be able to listen to our audience. What does that mean? First of all, we have to see where they're talking about representative issues, and we can use different tools on the market for that purpose. Google Alerts, Google Trends, or the Facebook and LinkedIn groups are good. Search on Twitter, and of course, all of the content on YouTube. So if we are monitoring, if we're listening, to what is being said 
by users regarding certain issues, that will help you identify where you should target. Where should you be or how should you be directing your message? If you look for sustainability under LinkedIn, you're going to find many, many groups. So if you want to be seen, participate in those groups. Remember to generate content, use that knowledge that you are gaining, and that way you can help people apply this experience. Identify the groups that are being created around conversations on Twitter. There are free of charge tools that you can find very easily with search engines. Look for how to do social listening. Look at the different exercises on the social media. Find those niches of conversation so that you can be heard. That's very important. First of all, listen to your audience, and that way you will be able to identify the channels for you to direct your messages to. Yeah, I would also just add, just thinking about those new tools that each platform has. So um, definitely take advantage of those. Normally, the algorithm will push your content up if you use those. But listening is the most important thing that you can do. Uh, and then next, play around with the new tools they offer. Normally, that'll push your content up. And like Camilo mentioned, you know, just follow those, put those Google alerts on, follow those leaders that are definitely important because they'll be sharing little tidbits here and there for the algorithms that they're working on. And that way you can stay ahead of the curve. And as you said, guys, you said that content is the king. But in terms of format, the, the new king is video. So how some tips in terms that people can produce more videos? Because videos things take time to be prepared or more productions. Maybe someone maybe thought that is more complicated. It's not just a tweet that is something that you can right and said in a way you need to be more careful about the storytelling the right moment to record your video so in terms of the idb are you creating more video right now on what tips you can share with our audience bueno lo primero es lo único que necesitas the es, first thing all you need is a mobile device All you need right now is a mobile device because a lot of the channels, a lot of the social media allows us to have those features to be able to optimize and create our content in a more professional manner. We can have very specialized sessions about the different functionalities that would provide you for good filters, good videos on Instagram, on Twitter, on LinkedIn, on uh, TikTok, there is a whole toolkit for creators. And that is making the creation of content easier and easier. Now, to get a recommendation on how to produce videos, first of all, develop a script. And it's a step-by-step -step in terms of the message you want to send. If you look at this, once you have a story, We showed you a testimony of that student working with the academy. They, he began telling about his experience in the course. So a specific course that taught the group five elements having to do with citizen and security. And it winds up showing cases where they have applied social, social security So you can write a script and that will help you practice and turn on your camera if you want more experience. And as you gain experience, the exercise will look much more natural and it will be faster to produce. But in principle, write your script, practice in front of the camera and always remember to identify this in one of your content pillars. When you're going to put together a content calendar, identify how you want to distribute this across the days on what 
pillar do you want to speak each day? And then the scripts that you write for your videos will help you build a story, a story that you will continue to tell on your personal channels. that have success on reels and TikToks are just people coming up with different things and, and talking from the heart. So um, don't get too bogged down by the camera itself. What's awesome about the past couple of years is that we're all pretty much used to being on a Zoom or a Teams camera. So we're not as camera shy as we used to be. So taking out your phone and putting it up against a book and recording a video shouldn't be that hard. But there's also tons of different tools and apps that you can use um, from Adobe Spark to just the innate tools in social media to make your content a little bit more engaging uh, that we definitely recommend you try out and look up. And over time, you know, you measure it just like we said in the presentation, see what worked, what didn't work, what people are drawn to, whether it's adding emojis or gifts to when you're talking or just putting your name or captions at the bottom. I could be here with you guys the whole day because you know that is the topic that I love most because I work with social media also, Camilo and Carrie. Thank you very much to be here and share all your knowledge and experience with our people that are connected in different countries here in the Semana de Conocimiento. Gracias, Camilo. Gracias, Carrie. So we have two more days full of activities, learning opportunities, and more. See you tomorrow at the Career Fair with focus on diversity, equality, and also inclusion. The three o'clock Eastern Time. Gracias a todos por acompañarnos. Este fue nuestro segundo Thank día. all of you for being with us. This was the second day of our Knowledge Week. We would like to hear from you. What did you think of today's program? What are you taking away from today's sessions? We heard a lot of rock stars today. We began with Encanto, the movie, which was a wow. We heard about the creative production and how this can become a way to promote tourism services, the perception of a country, the way a country sees itself. And here I am quoting Veronica, who shares my first name. She would say that Latin America and the Caribbean are beginning to believe their own message, that our countries are full of magic. Also, we heard from Richard Martinez from the Inter-American Development Bank. He's the vice president for countries. And also we heard from Young Talent. He is a good example of good management. And I think that that can be inspirational for a lot of people to hear from someone from Ecuador, who is the vice president of our countries. He represents young people and he is determined to improve lives by 2025. Also, we heard from our panelists in the career fair. We heard about the potential in the region. The limitation is that we have to begin to produce change today because this year is flying by. It is June already. We have six months and we'll be in 2023. So all these lessons are very valuable, but especially valuable when we begin to transform and change lives, making them better. Now, as a region, we have to accept the challenge of proposing better solutions. Some of you may be saying, I'm not in the public sector. How can I be an agent of change? But the truth is we're seeing collaboration between creatives, experience shared across different areas, and all of that fosters development of countries. Before we close, I wanted to remind you of three important things. First of all, and I know that you're waiting for this because this has to do with us, you need the digital credential so you can show the world that you attended all of the sessions of Knowledge Week. There's a QR on the screen right now that is going to help you download the credential. Very important. You can do it with your cell phone, or if you connected from a mobile device right now, don't worry. 
because we are putting our link on the screen so you can download the credential on LinkedIn and also on Facebook. You'll be able to download it. You have plenty of time. Don't worry. We want everyone to have their credentials because this means that we are promoting the talent, talent of the region. And that is the objective of this free of charge event. While you're downloading the credential, I wanted to tell you that all of these talks are being recorded and you can go back to them. You can hear them again. If you want to watch how to have a successful interview, hear from Eric again, you can do that. Other people wanted to hear day one again. Again, we know that people are busy. They're working. So you can share this with your friends. They can still register and they can see the course later. And then my second announcement, remember to use knowledge resources. In other words, more information that illustrates what you saw today. So these are resources, publications that were shared with you all day. There are other courses you can take online. And then the commitment of IDB Academy is not for one week. It's for year round. The idea is to inspire you to create a sense of urgency so that you will gain all of this information. And the third point has to do with the value of your opinion. We need to hear from you. Yesterday, or no, right now, we heard Carrie and Camila say that we're interested in hearing from you. Please respond to our survey. We'll be sharing with it with you. Remember that these are five days and we want to use and incorporate your suggestions. So the QR is on the screen so you can scan and download the survey to make this experience better. As I was saying, remember, you can go back and listen to the recordings whenever you want. And if you cannot be here the whole week, that's fine. So come watch us when you can and then listen to the recordings. So I hope to see you tomorrow. We'll be talking about gender and diversity. We have really exceptional guests, including two inspiring voices, people like Amanda, Michael Kaufman, and also we're going to have an in-person panel from the Universidad de los Andes in Bogota, Colombia, where we'll be talking about equity, gender, and labor markets. So on the screen, you're seeing part of tomorrow's agenda. You can see our panelists, our moderators, and also we'll have another conversation here from headquarters at the IDB. So we can talk about science, uh, behavioral sciences. And you may be wondering, behavioral science? Because yes, the way we interact leads to true development. And I just hope that this will entice you to join us tomorrow. Now, at the end of the week, after discussing all these issues, how will you be prepared for future conversations? to decide where you want to invest your time, if you want to change careers, jobs, or you can become leaders in your communities or in the private sector when you can create partnerships for the digital future of our countries. And then lastly, we will have the career fair. We will be doing this all five days. And we will have an opportunity to talk about diversity and inclusion. We'll be hearing from our colleagues at the Inter-American Development Bank. So please don't miss any of the days, and I will see you tomorrow. Es tiempo de mirar hacia adelante. De reimaginar el presente y futuro. Es hora de explorar, debatir y sorprenderse. La Semana de Conocimiento Academia BID es un espacio único para interactuar con conocimiento de vanguardia, práctico y relevante. Construye nuevas redes, encuentra nuevas oportunidades y conéctate con el conocimiento que está marcando el futuro de la región.
Es tiempo de mirar hacia adelante. 